So it seems that something is stirring beneath the ground and the two worlds are awakening once more. Let's talk through Canoptec creations, Savage Destroyers, and mind-bending technology with an overview of Codex Necrons in 10th edition 40k. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today we're talking Necrons, and in this video I thought we'd go over the match play contents of the new Codex in its entirety, talking through all the new detachments and updated datasheets for the book. I feel like Necron players are probably going to see the Codex as a bit of a mixed bag, certainly some things do feel like they've got a bit worse for the Tomb Worlds, but Games Workshop do seem to have added some really quite interesting ways to play the faction, and hopefully it'll overall amount to an interesting shake-up for the Tomb Worlds, with a few more armies being viable rather than the same old thing. In Codex Necrons, there's everything that you'd usually expect to find in a Warhammer 40k Codex, the latest lore for the faction, with all the exploration of dynasties and the ways that Necrons make war, Crusade content that is kind of fun and involves the awakening of a tomb world, combat patrol rules that you can also download free online for the new one with the Canoptec Doomstalker in it, but perhaps most importantly the match play rules for Warhammer 40k, the core rules for the army and how your standard Necrons will play on the table. Within that they have the reanimation protocols rule which is almost the same but has had a small tweak, five different detachments, the standard awakened dynasty that again has had some rules altered, the Abasance Phalanx, Annihilation Legion, Canoptic Court, and the Hypercrypt Legion, all with a primary special rule, four enhancements, and six stratagems. 47 datasheets total, one new one, and four have gone away. Lots of them have had some small alterations of one sort or another. And then there is a point section featured, but unfortunately it's redundant, as with the Space Marines and Tyranids, Games Workshop are going to release a digital download, which might make some hefty changes to it. At the moment, we really don't know. I'll certainly aim to cover those on a follow-up video on the channel, and I'll hopefully aim to link it down in the video description below, maybe as part of the pinned correction comments. We certainly can get to grips with all the rules of the new detachments and how the units actually fight though. A massive amount has changed, a lot for the better, though it does look like a fair bit has got a bit worse. First up, let's start with reanimation protocols. This is almost entirely the same way that it was back in the index version of the rule, though the core rule has had one tweak, and really quite a lot of the supporting rules for it have been changed, so it does feel like a bit of a different beast. As before, if when you get to the end of the command phase you have some Necron units that have taken damage, you get to roll a d3, and then add that many wounds back onto the unit. If they're just one wound models, then it's nice and simple, that many stand up and get returned to the board, you get to put them back onto the board and in the unit. If you've got multi-model units like these Locust Destroyers here, then you add the wounds sequentially, first any that are injured heal up, and then you start to restore the next one. So say with the situation that you had here, the middle one would heal up, and then you could restore two wounds worth of the one that had been destroyed, so now you have three destroyers in the unit again. When the unit returns to its max size once more, then any further reanimation is lost. I must admit I do quite like this rule, it feels very evocative for Necrons, certainly compared with the previous edition, when reanimation protocols just felt like an extra saving throw that you had, it is quite nice to have the models actually return to the board. And sometimes it can be interesting for in-game tricks as well. You could put them towards the front of the units to shorten a charge for later in the turn. Could be quite big if you reanimate a Wraith or a Scorpec Destroyer, for example. And it could also be big for objective control as well. You might be able to plonk a few more points of objective control on an objective before you get to claim it or not. It does happen after Battleshock though, so it means that you can't reanimate units to prevent you having to test. In general, the rule maybe puts some incentives both for the Necron player and the opponent though. The opponent really has a bit of an incentive not to try and just leave loads of your units just damaged but not wiped out, really focus fire and take down each one in turn if they possibly can, though it's not always possible. For the Necron player's point of view it does perhaps encourage castling a bit, trying to make one unit just so tough that it's borderline unkillable, then you'll be able to reanimate it, and there are various things that can improve reanimation. Unfortunately in this version of Codex Necrons, I feel like it's going to be a few feels bads in that a few of the things that were best to improve reanimation now have got worse. Warriors previously got a lot more reanimation rolls, but now they just re-roll the reanimation result, which is greatly reduced compared with previous. The Canoptic Reanimator adds D3 to your reanimation roll, which is really quite a meaningful boost. It does actually have to stay near the unit now though, as it only has a range of 3 inches. And the Resurrection Orb, rather than being an all-game thing now, it's gone back to being just a one-and-done mechanic. Once per battle, at the end of any one phase, you get to gesture around with your dusty spun glass orb, and that immediately triggers reanimation protocols 
to resurrect d6 wounds to the unit, so really quite a big boost all in one go there. But it does mean that you're not just going to be restoring your units in both command phases all game long like you were before. The same rule applies to the catacomb command barge now, just one infantry or mounted unit within 6 inches once per game, and the ghost art can allow the warriors to reanimate again out of phase, and there are plenty of other things from detachments that allow some out of sequence reanimation. Overall feels like it might just be a little bit harder to build a Necron castle of reanimation stuff to the sky. Might mean that you don't see quite as many enormously supported warrior or lich guard blocks walking around in the absolute top lists maybe. Otherwise the only small change to the core mechanic is that it clarifies that it doesn't work when you're off the board. So if you're in hypercrypt legion and a damaged unit returns to reserve, that unit will not be able to reanimate while it redeploys. Though there is a stratagem that would allow you to get around that. Overall the core mechanic remains the same. It is still going to be a mechanic that adds strength, but it's probably not going to be quite to the same extent where you're going to have Lich Guard and Necron Warrior blocks just pinging straight back to full health without much effort. But you can still get reanimation to be really quite efficient with a resurrection orb and a reanimator in the unit, plus other things like stratagem support. It'll probably take a bit of time to get used to, though I feel like it's still going to be an important part of the army. Moving on though, let's talk about perhaps the biggest thing that this codex adds, and that's the detachments with some new ways to play Necrons. As with other indexes that we've seen so far, none of them lock out any models. There aren't any restrictions that say that you can't take any one model in any one of these detachments. It's more a case of the special rules and the stratagems and things just bringing you more incentives to bring some things than others. Basically, if you went too heavy on any one thing in one of the detachments, you might just create an army that's going to be better if you're on it with one of the different ones. As per normal, each one of these gets a primary rule for enhancements and six stratagems. And aside from the Awakened Dynasty, which is the standard one, the one that gets you a plus one to hit for your leader units and various other leader related things, the other ones go a bit more heavily around keywords. The Obeisance Phalanx is focused on Lich Guard, Triarch Praetorians, and Necron Overlords. The Annihilation Legion is all destroyers and flayed ones, there's basically no support for anything besides them. The Hypercrypt Legion is the teleport one, you're very strongly encouraged to have a monolith in that one given all the stratagem support for them. They would say that the core rule is pretty handy for quite a lot of the army really, big redeployment tricks. And then there's the Canoptic Court, big damage and utility boosts for the Cryptech and Canoptic units out there. This one does look rather fun, things like Wraiths and Doomstalkers seem like the order of the day. Jumping into it, let's start out with the Abasance Phalanx. This one's the one that's focused around the Lich Guard, Triarch Praetorians and Overlords, so very much feels like the commanding elite of the Necron army. Not everything is just locked to those though, a few of the stratagems are a bit more general purpose than some of the keyworded detachments. Their primary rule I think is kind of fun, it's called Worthy Foes and it also acts like a mini Necron Oath of Moment. In the command phase you get to nominate one enemy unit, and then any Triarch Praetorians, Overlord or Lich Guard units all get plus one to wound that unit. Really quite a handy damage boost there, that's going to be very meaningful, particularly if you're wounding on a five or a six or something. Overlord keyword units would mean anything that they're leading as well, so could get some big damage out of things like Necron Immortals or Gauss Reaper Warriors. It is definitely a lot more limited than Space Marines Oath, though I suppose it's not the primary army rule. And maybe a little bit less scope for focusing fire with loads of things, unless you have something like a crazy immortal gun line with loads of overlords in or something. In general, it's going to be a bit harder to bring loads of units to bear on one unit if most of your damage dealers are kind of better in melee than at range, but should mean that you put the smackdown abnormally hard on one enemy threat per turn. Full stratagems for one CP, they're Sentinels of Eternity. That's Lich Guard or Triad Praetorians get to fight on 4 plus triggered when they're nominated to be attacked rather than failing saves or anything. Like the rest of the places that crops up, I think it's kind of fine but not standout. Could get you some damage if the opponent's just about to wipe you out en masse. Perhaps particularly nice if you get hit hard by a fragile melee damage dealer and aren't likely to live to swing back. For 1 CP, there's Suffer No Rival, Lich Guard or Triarch keyword units, game precision melee. Kind of situational, I guess occasionally you could snipe out a really important buffing character. A fair bit of the time though, if you're engaging a unit where you can't kill the squad, then you might get hit back very hard anyway. Though I guess against the right tar pit unit or Death Star type unit, it could be big. For 1 CP, there's Territorial Obsession. This one happens in your command phase, and again it's a Lich Guard or a Triarch unit. For this one, you get plus 1 objective control, or plus 3 objective control if you're a vehicle. So I guess that would be if you, you choose a Triarch Stalker as the target of it. 
as that triggers in your command phase, I guess that's one that you use if it's literally going to tip the balance between actually taking a point or not taking a point. Unless you're risking battle shock or something like that, then you can just basically see if that's going to add up to victory points or not. So just every so often it will be a chance to trade command points for victory points. I'm sure they'll go in tie games where it's not going to be relevant. Otherwise, for 1 CP, if you manage to slay the enemy warlord and your warlord is still alive to be the target of a stratagem, then you can use your time is nigh. For the rest of the game, the enemy will be minus 1 to battleshock tests or leadership tests for the entire rest of the game army-wide. That one's certainly going to be a bit random and scattergun, as battleshock always is. But if your opponent does have plenty of depleted units, or you've managed to kill their leading character really quite early, then I suppose that could be worth throwing a command point, uh, just giving them a chance to fail some tests. Again, doesn't really seem like reliable value though. I feel like I've perhaps saved the best two for last though. As for one command point, there's Enslaved Artifice. This one's a battle tactic one, so it could be used for free with an Overlord. And for this one, you choose a non-Titanic Necron unit, and you get critical hits on a 5+, plus, whether you're shooting or fighting. Though you can't use it for Overwatch, it's just in your shooting phase or in the fight phase. Critical hits of a 5 plus are rather nice, it means that you could get sustained hits too with a bunch of Tesla Immortals or lots of easy auto wounding Gauss. And given there's an enhancement that allows you to get some big hit rerolls, you could fish for those 5s and 6s. Potentially could be quite nice with Locust Destroyers with their Gauss weapons. They can get full hit rerolls against an enemy objective unit now or even Scorpec Destroyers led by a Scorpec Lord. This one feels like one of the more important ones out of the stratagems. Finally, for one command point, there's Nano Assembly Protocols. This one's a battle tactic, and a Necron Vehicle unit gets minus one damage this phase. Kind of feels a little bit out of place compared with the rest, affecting a vehicle unit, but I think I'd certainly take it. One CP for minus one damage can be absolutely huge against the right thing. Against, say, things like damage two or damage three, you're going to save a lot of hits. I would rate this as one of the better stratagems out of the detachment. If you had the mind to, you could even give this to a Titanic unit like a Monolith. Overall, I'd say that a fair few of those stratagems do seem kind of niche or kind of borderline value. The rest two, I'd say, are the last one, Enslaved Artifice and Nano Assembly Protocols. They feel like they're usually going to be the most reliable value for the points, I'd say. Finally, we get to the enhancements, and these can only be taken by Overlord models. It does appear that the Catacomb Command Barge doesn't have the Overlord keyword, unfortunately. As mentioned, points cost for the enhancements aren't yet known. It means we won't really know which ones are the best yet, but we can get a grip of the rules, and Games Workshop should allow them as a digital download sometime in the next week or so. Going through them, Honourable Combatant means that if you slay an enemy character in combat, then they'll lose a command point, kind of an unusual sort of debuff, but does seem kind of situational. Necrons aren't usually known to be melee powerhouses. Maybe an okay one to include on an aggressive character, though, if it was very cheap to use up some last points. Unflinching Will does help to make your Overlord a bit scarier. You get Precision Melee and you get Anti-Infantry 5 Plus in Melee. Anti-Infantry usually wouldn't be that relevant as you're usually wounding on better than that anyway, but seeing as the Overlord weapons are devastating wound weapons, it means that you could get some devastating wounds with their Overlord Blade. Again, that feels like it's alright, does feel like it could give your Overlord actually a reasonably scary chance of killing an enemy character, or at least threatening to do so. Otherwise, Warrior Noble gives you minus one to hit for your bearer's unit in melee. That one does feel like just a handy debuff for a unit that's getting aggressive. Seems a nice one to have on Sword and Board Lich Guard, though it seems like it'd also be pretty fine on Warriors as well, just having them be extra durable in combat, while the enemies know but out trying to scrape them off the midfield objectives before they run off with all the points. And then finally, Eternal Conqueror grants you reroll hit rolls against enemy units on objectives. And out of any of them, this one seems like the most reliably good. You're often going to be wanting to damage enemy units on objectives, as that's most of what 40k is about. Fighting big blows back and forth to take the midfield and take it back. Even if that one winds up being a fairly expensive one, it feels like that's just very reliable extra value added to your army. Could be really nice with that critical hits of 5 plus 1, and maybe particularly nice for things with the Gauss keyword getting to auto wound on 6s or maybe even 5s. Overall, that does seem rather nice. Overall, from first impressions, I feel like the Abasance Phalanx maybe feels like a sort of middling one. I'm not sure it's going to be the strongest out of the detachments for the Necrons, but at least the core rule is genuinely usable. It is a useful damage output boost and encourages a few different units. The critical hits of 5 plus 1 seems like a good one to go to out of the stratagem options, but I feel like a few of them are rather niche or situational. Maybe nice to have a vehicle along for the minus 1 damage as well. 
and then perhaps most reliably out of these enhancement ones, the minus one to hit in melee and reroll hits against enemies on objectives, both seem pretty nice on big lead units by overlords trying to take the midfield, whether they're lich guard or warriors or maybe even immortals. Overall I say it does look interesting, whether or not it's enough to overcome the temptation of the easy plus ones to hit and the powerful stratagems of the awakened dynasty though is maybe more of a question. Cryptex and their creations next, and here we have the Canoptec Court. This detachment gives you some serious boosts and very powerful stratagem options for anything with those two keywords. The army's primary rule is one called the Power Matrix. It works kind of similarly to the Chaos Demons key rule, the one where they basically have to take objectives and establish dominion of the battlefield. For the Necrons, your deployment zone always counts as being within your Power Matrix, and if you manage to take half or more of the objectives in the midfield, then the midfield counts as your Power Matrix, and it's checked at the start of each phase, so you can move on to it, and then the midboard will be powered up for your shooting phase. And the same goes for the enemy deployment zone. That's rarely going to happen though, unless the opponent lets you take their home field objective. Then the core rule buff, I'd say, is a very good one for these keyworded units. You just get to reroll hit rolls of one for Canoptic and Cryptic units all the time anyway, power matrix or not. And then for every unit that's within the power matrix, you get to fully reroll the hit roll. That really is kind of enormous, given that a lot of Canoptic things hit on a 4 plus. You've just gone from hitting half the time to hitting three quarters of the time, and things might be even bigger if you have effects that go off on six, like Gauss or Tesla. And the buff does seem like a very easy one to establish as well. The idea would be that you just move on to those objectives in your movement phase. Usually Necrons have some good presence in the midboard with loads of objective control. Power up the power matrix, all ready to go to town for damage in the shooting phase and fight phase. It feels like in a lot of games this should just equate to re-roll hit rolls for those units pretty much most of the time. It's going to be good for all the obvious things, Doomstalkers all really like it, Wraiths will be good with it and they've got a lot better in this edition, but it also applies to anything led by a Cryptic as well. They can't lead Lich Guard anymore, but they can lead things like Warriors and Immortals, so again that should be full re-rolls to hit for them most of the time as they're taking those points. That's pretty cool stuff, given that Warriors and Immortals often wanted Cryptex in the units anyway. It's a really strong start, and I feel like the rules get better from there. For the stratagems, for one command point, there's Curse of the Cryptech. This one's a battle tactic. You trigger this when an enemy slays a Cryptech with shooting or fighting, and then all the rest of your Canoptech units on the board, which you probably have a lot of in this, get plus one to hit and wound that unit from now on. It's not going to happen literally all the time, but I'd imagine in this formation you are going to be going fairly Cryptech heavy. Most units that can get one will probably take a Cryptech, so when the opponent inevitably does kill one of those, you get the option to put a big debuff on them. If that was something very scary, like an enemy Terminator Death Star or a big knight or something, then it's more than worth it. Could mean that that enemy unit is now sitting in the open and ready for a whole world of hurt. For 2CP, there's Sinister of Eradication. Another battle tactic, so maybe one that's a bit more tempting to use with an Overlord's free one there. At the start of your shooting phase or fight phase, one Cryptek or Canoptek unit within your power matrix gets devastating wounds. I guess that could be kind of fun with maybe a unit of Immortals with a Cryptek and an Overlord attached perhaps. That could give you a whole load of Tesla fire and hopefully get some devastating wounds as a result as they reroll wound rolls against things on objectives. Otherwise for 2CP it's probably a little bit on the expensive side. I guess if you just need a pop-up damage boost and you desperately need something to die, this could be pretty good on just about anything with good volume attacks though, whether it's something like Warriors or a whole load of Wraith attacks. For 1CP, there's Solar Pulse. A Cryptek model nominates an objective within 18 inches, and then all friendly Necrons on the board get to ignore cover when they're targeting units on that point. I'd say that one's alright. It could help you out if you need to clear a bunch of things with higher saves on a point that you're in cover. I guess perhaps nice enough if you're really focusing fire with a whole bunch of your army. Doesn't maybe feel quite as standout or as unusual as some of the rest though. Back to the really good stuff though, and there's reactive subroutines for 1CP. This one's a reactive movement type mechanic. When the enemy ends a move within 9 inches of you, then you get to move your Canoptech unit 6 inches, so you could use that to backpedal from a charge or hide behind terrain or similar. This one has the potential to be truly game changing. You might be able to keep a unit alive that would have otherwise died to a charge. Movement shenanigans or threatening them in the enemy turn is pretty awesome. For 1 CP, there's Cantemporal Shift. This one's a truly massive one that's often seen in play on Chaos Space Reinforged Fiends. 
A Conoctet unit that's shot by an enemy unit can't be shot if it's greater than 12 inches away, and that will leave the enemy unit having to be declared target. It basically means that if you've got a unit that's greater than 12 inches away in the enemy shooting phase, this CP will be able to make it essentially invincible. An enormous positive if it was sitting on a crucial objective or about to hit back the enemy very hard next turn. This one's definitely one that could cause your opponent some pretty nightmarish problems, as unless they get up very close to you, then you could just basically activate this on the thing that they'll find most painful. Finally, for one CP, we've got Suboptimal Facade. A Canoptech unit gets to activate reanimation protocols after the enemy just declared a charge against that unit, so I guess typically that's usually going to be one command point for an extra D3 wounds to restore to the unit, maybe a bit more if there happens to be a Canoptech reanimator nearby. I'm not really too convinced on that one, just D3 wounds for one CP on a unit that's likely just to go out to get hit first by an enemy unit seems like it could be a waste. Probably going to be best value if you're just sure that that unit isn't going to get wiped out by the enemy, and particularly if there's a Canoptech reanimator sat nearby to give you an extra D3 to that roll. Overall though, I'd call this a standout good stratagem section. Being able to shroud your units from ranged firepower is great. Reactive subroutines to form movement shenanigans is really big. Debuffing an enemy unit that killed one of your crypt techs could add to a lot of damage, adding to the detachment core rule very nicely. And the Sinisher of Eradication with the Overlords making it free for Immortals and things does seem like it could be pretty terrifying to cleanse the foe from objectives with a whole bunch of devastating wounds. Even if he couldn't take any enhancements, this would already be a very strong detachment, I think. Finally, we do get onto those enhancements, though, and all of these can only be taken by Cryptex, as you'd probably expect. The Dimensional Sanctum is a nice simple one and grants infiltrators to the unit. This one, again, is absolutely standout. It's probably going to be best on a Technomancer, either with Necron Warriors or with the Wraiths, which they can now join. Big durable units that can start in the midfield. Just having a really tanky block of warriors standing on an objective right from the go it seems like it will be good. It would help you get that power matrix started with one safe objective as well, and they are a unit that should be tanky enough to take a punch. Raids are also really quite durable right now, so you don't need to worry too much about putting them up the board, and they could actually threaten some serious damage with first turn charges with at least a fairly good move, and hit the enemy with some close range shooting and a whole bunch of strength 6 damage 2 attacks. Seems good, unless it's absolutely extortionately costed, that feels like a very good rule to have in the army. The Hyperphasic Fulcrum is also quite a nice one I think, this one's just a short and simple damage buff for reroll wound rolls of 1 for units wholly within the power matrix, probably nowhere near as important as the Dimensional Sanctum points dependent, but again this seems absolutely fine to have on something like a massed up warrior squad, or perhaps a unit of wraiths with a Technomancer. They're already very likely to be re-rolling the hit rolls just from the detachment, re-rolling wound rolls of one as well is only going to add to the carnage. Next, the Auto Divinator is an option to capture enemy command point farming. When an opponent gains a command point as part of an ability, you roll a 2+, plus, and if you do, then you gain a command point yourself. This one's going to be really big in some games, and it could add up to potentially all the way up to 5 CP, depending on what your opponent has. Some armies just don't have reliable ways of refunding CP like that though, or might choose to pass them up for other options. Bit of a weird one that's going to be great in some games, but do absolutely nothing in others. It might also depend on whether or not you want to take Imitech the Stormlord as well. There's pretty much no point in having this as well as him on the board, as you can only generate one command point yourself per battle round. If it's cheap enough, then this could absolutely be well worth throwing in though, with those powerful stratagems around, ideally on a safe Cryptech if possible. Finally, there's the Metallodermal Tesla Weave. When the bearer's unit is selected as a target of a charge, the enemy takes D3 mortal wounds on a 2 plus, or 3 mortal wounds on a 6. I'd guess that given those rules that this one will be pretty cheap, I'd be surprised if it was more than 10 or 15 points. If it's around that amount, then it does seem solid. Maybe good for a Cryptech leading a warrior block or something. Something that's going to be fighting over the midfield and is quite likely to get charged, Taking a chunk out of the charging unit as soon as it makes contact seems like a good way to get off to melee on the right start. Overall, this attachment really does seem to have the full sweep, a really powerful core rule, really quite good stratagems and some very good enhancements, most of which look like they'd be pretty playable even if they weren't enormously cheap. I guess the main weakness of the detachment is that it's really heavily dependent on those keywords and it doesn't do much for anything else. It genuinely looks like this could be a strong way to play Necrons though despite that, Wraiths and Doomstalkers getting the most out of big damage boosts. 
Warriors or Immortals taking down some midfield objectives, maybe purging the foe with some devastating wounds or setting up in the midfield, and I guess any other data sheets for support could just try and carry themselves without extra stratagem things. I'd be kind of surprised if we didn't see at least a fair few people playing with this one. It does feel like it gives you a lot of passive buffs and a lot of good value from the command points. Next up, we've got Necrons but Grey Knights. This is the Hypercrypt Legion, and basically the idea is Grey Knight style movement tricks, Necrons warping on and off the board and popping it in and out of reserve. Feels like it maybe has the heart of the dimension warping Nefrec tomb world, and also seems to be weirdly obsessed about making you field a monolith in it. Most of the stratagems and even the core rule are really quite good for them. The detachment's primary rule is hyperphasing. Each turn you get to return a number of units to strategic reserves at the end of the opponent's turn depending on battle size, so 2 units in incursion, 3 units in strike force, and 4 units in onslaught. The only stipulation on those units is they can't be actually in engagement range, otherwise anything else is fair game, whether it's got deep strike or not. Then in your own turn, unless it's the first battle round I guess, your units will then return to the board. Things without deep strike can turn up on the flanks, maybe get some good lines of sight on things, or could turn up next to the monolith via its core rule. But things that do have deep strike are a lot more flexible. It does combine with the strategic reserve keyword as per the designer's commentary. So say if you had a unit of death marks enter the table and enter strategic reserve, they could come back via their deep strike. Theoretically at least, it means that you could have a whole bunch of necrons warping around the table, picking some very unfair fights with the enemy and just lighting them up with a bunch of close range firepower, maybe trying to overwhelm one section of the board and then teleporting and redeploying before the opponent can catch up with them to try and do it somewhere else. Feels like it could be a fair bit more meaningful for the Necrons than the Grey Knights as well, as the Grey Knights often just struggle for damage output, whereas Necrons do have at least a fair amount of good shooting units. Being able to just repeatedly line up some pretty optimal shooting alpha strikes does seem nice. Monoliths seem great to help out with the deployment things, and they could also use the rule themselves as they themselves have deep strike. The stratagems, however, do seem to be very, very monolith heavy. For two combined points, there's Dimensional Corridor. This allows you to charge straight out of arriving via the monolith rule, provided the monolith itself started on the battlefield, so you couldn't redeploy that. Two CP is pricey, and it's not a battle tactic, so it does cost a lot, but in theory, it means that you could move a monolith up eight inches now get the unit out with its own special rule with its eternity gate and then just have a scary squad delivered straight into melee maybe something like some scorpec destroyers or lich guard or similar it does feel like a monolith of all things might have the durability to allow it to get close otherwise for 2 cp another big price you play is the hyperphasic recall you select an infantry unit that just have one or more models destroyed in the enemy shooting phase or the fight phase and this unit teleports back to a monolith setting up anywhere within 6 inches of it and not in engagement range with enemy units. This one is one that could be very very powerful. Say you had a dangerous unit that had just finished killing something and the enemy was about to light up with their entire gun line, the first thing that shot them and killed a model could trigger the unit to recall itself back to safety. You could even then put it back into strategic reserves at the end of the turn, so it both saved its life and put it up back into the warp pretty much to redeploy. It could just also use it to set up a big strike on the enemy next turn, maybe something took some casualties in the fight phase on the other side of the board, then set it up next to the monolith ready to charge something else. It is a big 2 CP, but you could get some very big plays with this if the monolith could survive. For one command point, there's Entropic Dampening. This is a titanic unit that shot by a unit within 18 inches makes their weapons hazardous. Again, it's monolith support time, I guess it'd work with the other super heavies though. Maybe a little bit niche in that you have to have an enemy unit that's walked right up to the super heavy and tried to shoot it in the face, and it's got to be a unit that actually cares about the hazardous rolls, so it needs to be something that's firing with really quite a lot of guns. Realistically, I think that this one's a little bit situational, and it's not going to usually add up to any reliably huge amount of damage. I'd probably save command points for something else unless you have an absolutely optimal target. Otherwise though, for one command point, we've got Cosmic Precision. This one allows you to deep strike or hyperphaser units to drop them anywhere that's just outside of 3 inches of enemy units and make most of their screening kind of useless. As per normal, you're not allowed to charge after that, but the position that allows you to drop your units in is kind of massive. I feel like this one is an absolutely awesome one and should get used really quite a lot. I guess it's quite nice for deep strike units being able to just set them up maybe somewhere in the enemy backfield, but I probably wouldn't underestimate it just on strategic reserve type units as well. 
It's kind of easy to screen out 9 inches from all the board edges, a lot harder to bother to screen out 3. You could drop a big block of warriors in the enemy backfield potentially, or have a whole load of locust destroyers crop up somewhere where the enemy really should have been able to screen them out quite easily, but otherwise could just jump right into what should have been a safe enemy castle and blast a whole load of things to death. It's great for secondary objectives, and maybe even sneaking primary objectives as well if the opponent has set up slightly off them. Not being able to properly screen their backfield means you can turn up and deploy teleport homers and things. There really are a lot of shenanigans with this one, and I feel like it's one that I'd certainly be considering on several turns throughout the game. For one command point, there's reanimation crypts. As mentioned with the reanimation protocols bit at the start of the video, you can't use them when you're in strategic reserve. But with this command point, provided your warlord is still alive to be a target of the stratagem, then you can. I guess you just have to take a look at the units in the sky at that point and see what sort of shape they're in. Is getting them all to reanimate going to be actually worth the 1 CP? If you're affecting units that could be some fairly good damage dealers, then maybe yes. If it's just going to get you 2 or 3 warriors back, then maybe not. Finally, for 1 command point, just in case we didn't have enough monolith things, for one command point, you can get a Necron vehicle to have a 4 plus invulnerable save, either in the shooting or the fight phase. Again, this one is maybe slightly painfully monolith targeted, given that almost every other Necron vehicle does have a 4 plus invulnerable save. I guess it could be relevant for lighter vehicles like the Canoptic Spider or the Canoptic Reanimator, that they're a little bit low value, or you could use it on things like the Doom Scythe, Night Scythe, or I suppose the Obelisk. Realistically though, I think in most cases it probably is going to be the monolith that will be the best target, though it might not be quite as overwhelming if you already had cover. I guess with just how many tricks you can do with monoliths in this detachment, it's worth trying to keep them safe. Overall, I think that some of the stratagems for this one are really quite fun, maybe one that you could definitely have a lot of shenanigans and lots of big plays that you could think your way around. I think my single favourite one is the drop just outside of 3 inches one, either for delivering close range shooting damage dealers, or do sneaky objective things, otherwise both of the big 2 CP ones do have a lot of potential for having some pretty game changing stuff if you can use and coordinate with a monolith. Delivering melee units into deep strike type charges they otherwise couldn't make, or zipping things back to the monolith to stop them from dying. Feels like Imitech the Stormlord might not be the worst fit for this detachment, rustling you up some extra CP for the big 2 command point ones. Finally for enhancements and things, First up we have the Osteoclave Fulcrum. This one's nice, simple and very effective in this detachment, granting the bearer's unit deep strike, so you could have warriors and mortals, or maybe even locust destroyers with a locust lord coming down anywhere on the board. Really strong in combination with the detachment rule, having things like locusts or heavy locusts jumping around the board, getting exactly what line of sight they want would be great, and seems nice to get things like Gauss Reaper warriors into range if you want it. Dimensional Overseer is the next one, this one gives you plus one to the number of units that can hyperphase provided the bearers either on the battlefield or in strategic reserves, so even more warping shenanigans there. I feel like this one is maybe a little bit lower yield than it sounds, you already get to do the warping things with your three favourite units at strike force level. The only one that you're going to be gaining after that is the least important of four units, so it's maybe not quite as big as it sounds. If the limits were a little bit harsher, then it could be almost auto-include, but otherwise it's probably a little bit take or leave. If it's really cheap though, then it's probably worth having. Arisen Tyrant is a really nice damage dealer one. This one gets you re-roll hit rolls of 1 for the bearer's unit, or re-roll all hit rolls if you came in from reserve this turn. This one's just awesome for a shooting unit. With Necron Immortals, you could maybe have this to have them re-rolling all hits and all wounds when they jump in from the board. It could be pretty massive with a Plasmancer as well for loads of sustained hits, twos or lethal hits with Gauss. Seems very nice with the Locust Lord as well, teleporting around heavy destroyers. I guess there's a good chance that regular Locust will get the full hit rerolls anyway these days. Again, this one seems like really reliable value depending on price. Finally, there's the Hyperspatial Transfer node. This one allows you to auto advance 6 inches, so I guess that will be for units that are remaining on the board and aren't warping around. I guess that's handy on anything with the assault keywords like Tesla Immortals again. I guess similar to Grey Knights you are going to need at least some on the board presence otherwise you're not going to score any objectives. I'd say this one is probably okay if it's cheap. Again I feel like this is one of the ones that I'm most positive about. I really do quite like the massive amount of redeployment that you can get with this and I do think it's going to be more impactful than the Grey Knight rules really given that Necrons can do some hefty damage at range whereas Grey Knights tend to be more melee focused with power weapons. 
barring a few bits and bobs. So just repeatedly turning up at 9 inches away from the enemy isn't necessarily the biggest deal in the world. Not when you have to make charges on infantry at 9 inches to get the damage output. Otherwise I really like the big movement play stratagems. It does seem like you're almost going to definitely want a monolith in this one. I'd be quite tempted to have things like packs of death marks warping around the board. Maybe with some locust destroyers or locust heavies going around the flanks. And make some good use of the enhancements on some of the biggest damage dealers. Definitely looks like a fun way to play Necrons in any case, and I feel like that could have some pretty good value for most more balanced Necron armies out there. Next up, and moving away from clever Necron trickery to the rabid desire to destroy all life, we have the Annihilation Legion. This one representing a destroyer cult, a pleasant Necron gentleman who like to modify their limbs to give them big blades or big guns built into their bodies to hopefully destroy all the living because they're kind of annoyed at them for not having undergone a horrific biotransference and losing their souls and everything. Unfortunately, I must admit the rules for the Annihilation Legion do feel kind of half-baked. A lot of the actual destroyer datasheets did get a bit better in terms of their raw rules, particularly Scorpet destroyers, and the Locust improved quite a lot in my opinion. But I feel like this one might be a bit of a tough sell compared with Awakened Dynasty, even if you are going at least fairly destroyer heavy. The Annihilation Protocols is their core rule, and it allows you to re-roll charges with the destroyers, and if the target of your charge happens to be below half strength, then you get plus one to the charge roll as well. I'd say that this one really isn't a particularly strong faction rule, it's only going to be relevant basically for the Scorpet destroyers, and I suppose flayed ones as well, most of the rest just really don't care that much about being in combat, though I suppose it could be alright for Ophidian destroyers trying to make deep strike charges perhaps, Ophidians and flayed ones generally feel like they're only really that good for just flaying down enemy infantry. Scorpet destroyers are the only real mainline damage dealers, though at least they have improved for that role quite a bit, getting a lot more threatening on the charge. I feel like 90% of the time or more this is probably just going to be the rerolls. I guess occasionally you might get lucky and just happen to be charging something that was below half strength. It's not going to be something that you can reliably arrange, and even if you did try and shoot down an enemy infantry unit to try and make it so, they might just pull their models in such a way that it makes your charge longer and kind of defeat the point. I guess whenever you do succeed a charge due to this rule, it is going to be a pretty big deal. Could save you some CP at any rate, but I wouldn't say that it's an overall strong one. Moving on to stratagems, and for one command point, we've got Blood Fueled Cruelty. This one inflicts a little bit of pain on enemies while they're falling back. On a 2+, plus, they take D3 mortal wounds, and on 3 mortal wounds on a 6, and this one, like the rest of the stratagems, can only affect destroyers or flayed ones. As well as that, you also get to make a normal move, and end your move as close as possible to the enemy unit that just fell back. Being a normal move though, you can't use it to wind up in combat with them, and I feel like a lot of what's going to happen after that is that the enemy unit takes a little bit of damage, and then just gets shot in the face by the rest of the enemy army, or countercharged. I guess probably best if that extra little bit of damage is absolutely critical, maybe say finishing off an enemy character that happened to live on one wound or similar. I guess the extra movement might be situationally big on objectives, but it's not like you've got much control of where you go. For one command point, there's murderous reanimation. A destroyer cult or flayed one unit either wipes out an enemy unit in melee or reduces it to below half strength, and that unit can then immediately activate reanimation protocols, usually gaining D3 wounds. I guess if you're near a Canoptech reanimator, that could be 2d3. Usually I'd say that one command point for just d3 extra wounds on the table isn't really the best value in the world. Probably not one to use most of the time that you're doing this. Perhaps the best situational value might be if you just happen to kill an enemy unit in their turn, then you could at least maybe have one extra model to make charge distances shorter for your own next turn, or be ready to inflict a little bit of extra damage. Again, it does feel kind of niche though. For one command point, we've got Insanity's Ire. This one's targeted on a destroyer cult or flayed one unit that's just lost a model to enemy shooting, and then your unit immediately makes a normal move towards that enemy unit and must end as close as possible. I feel like this one is probably one to trigger on perhaps an oncoming unit of Scorpet destroyers led by a Scorpet Lord, perhaps. It could really punish your opponent for doing a bit of chip damage to them in their turn. Getting an extra 8 inch movement out of that could be huge, and it could leave them with charge targets they otherwise couldn't reach, particularly with your charge rerolls. Again, I think it would have to be one that you'd have to think about triggering though, if you just trigger it in the middle of the enemy shooting phase, and then they can just light you up with a whole bunch of other things, or even just counter charge you. Again, this could just be throwing command points down the drain to overexpose your units when they can't handle the heat. In the right circumstances though, this one could be very nice. 
maybe particularly if it happens to move them behind terrain in the midfield while you do so. Next up for one command point we've got Masks of Death, this pleasant sounding one apparently puts their enemies off shooting or damaging them, a minus one to hit for one of your destroyer or flayed one units when they're shot or attacked in melee. Nothing wrong with this one I guess, a reactive durability boost is usually handy to have, if the opponent's really trying to take out a unit that's on an objective or whittle down your oncoming melee rush, then that should up your durability a bit, and it's particularly effective against anything that was hitting you on a 4 before. For one command point we've got Spore of Frailty which is a battle tactic one, not that I suppose it's particularly relevant given that overlords can't join these units, but this one's a damage boost when your destroyer cult or flayed one unit either shoots or fights, a plus one to hit if the enemy unit is below starting strength, and a plus one to wound if the enemy unit is below half strength, occasionally that could be a handy enough damage boost I suppose, kinda depends on where your unit is, what it's fighting and how hard it is going to be to overcome that unit, it's not enormously great on score effect destroyers on the charge given that they re-roll hit rolls anyway these days. Seems like it's best value against depleted units with the plus one to wound roll. Maybe could be nice for finishing off something important that's heavily damaged like an enemy big tank or imperial knight. Finally for one command point there's pitiless hunters. This one's a pile in and consolidate boost for your army. Your unit gets to pile in and consolidate six inches this phase each. That one could be nice enough for tagging enemies after you've wiped out a unit or potentially moving on to an objective after you've killed a unit, both of which are really quite big. It does seem particularly quite nice with the enhancement that allows you to prevent fall back on a 3+, plus, potentially wiping a unit to then go and tag something that really doesn't want to have to remain in combat with you could be very nasty on that. And it is quite a nice option just to have in the back pocket, even if it's only going to be a thing that you have to decide on a case by case basis. If it gets you more victory points or puts something in combat that doesn't want to be there, then all well and good. Overall I'd say that it's probably not the happiest stratagem section out there. I can't help but think that just about all of it either feels kind of low yield or kind of situational. Not really anything that you use just reliably at every turn and actually gets you great value. Plus ones to hit are nice enough, minus ones to hit are nice enough. I'd say maybe the biggest things that you can do with it are the movement shenanigans. Insanity's Eye getting you an extra 8 inch movement with score pecs seems like that could be well worth the CP. And extra consolidation is really big but only when it's actually going to make a difference. Finally we have the enhancements for the Annihilation Legion. Eternal Madness is the first and this one can be any Necron model, doesn't have to be a destroyer. And this one grants a 4 plus to fight on death if models in the bearer's unit haven't already fought. Depending on the price that seems absolutely fine for Scorpex or Lich Guard perhaps. Nice to go down swinging if your opponent hits you with a big scary combat unit though it won't be very relevant against shooting armies. Ingrained Superiority is a destroyer court model only. This one gives you critical wounds for the bearer's units getting an extra AP minus one better. This one works in both range and melee but given that both the Locust Destroyers and the Scorpex Destroyers when they're led are likely to be having lethal hits. It does feel like there's a bit of anti-synergy here. Even in the best circumstances, it's not really the strongest buff in the world. Definitely doesn't really hurt to have on some locusts or some scorpex, or even something like some heavy destroyers with enmitic weapons, but I feel like it's going to be a second choice unless it's super cheap. Solus Reaper is again destroyer cult only. This one's the really big and disruptive one, where you have a 3 plus chance to prevent enemy units from falling back from the bearer's units. That's kind of an unusual ability in 40k, there's only a few things that stop you from falling back from units, and this one isn't even locked to some of the normal things like non-vehicle or monster units, you can lock things like titanic units in combat like this if you'd like. I guess you'd be most likely to use that on a Scorpet Lord with Scorpet Destroyers, though I guess you could just have a Lord or Locust Lord going in solo if you just wanted literally the disruption and nothing else. But it seems that that could be a massive great big problem against an enemy army that didn't have enough melee to counter charge you, try and charge and lock up multiple enemy units and then they won't be able to fall back and they'll have to fight you and melee multiple turns over. That one does probably feel like the best enhancement out of the detachment. Finally there's Eldritch Nightmare, again destroyer cult model only, this one is a battleshock test for all enemies in engagement range at the start of the fight phase, as ever this one's kind of pointless unless Games Workshop changed the core battleshock rules, might be relevant for things like certain enemy stratagems, scoring secondaries at the end of the turn, or I guess if it happens in your own fight phase and then it might actually be relevant for objective scoring if they get unlucky and fail. Most of the time they're likely going to pass though, so it's usually not going to be relevant even then. 
Overall, I have a feeling that it's probably not going to be what most people hoped for in a Destroyer-type Legion. I think that the actual data sheets have improved a fair bit, particularly Scorpex and Locus, as we'll get onto. But for actually standout strong things, I feel like you've only really got Scorpex Destroyers running at you extra fast, getting big consolidations, and maybe trying to lock you in melee. It definitely feels like units like that will genuinely be quite strong. But it also feels like this kind of detachment isn't really helping you out with all that much beyond that. Unless they get ridiculously cheap, I can't really see many people running Flayed Ones or Ophidian Destroyers as any sort of mainline damage dealer. They're just a bit fragile per the point. Finally though, we get to the Awakened Dynasty, the core detachment from the Index. I feel like this is still going to be a really interesting one for most people. It has had quite a few minor changes that aren't really game-breaking. Though I would say that most of the changes have been to make the detachment slightly weaker in one way or another. Maybe that's partly due to trying to have it balanced with the rest, and not just be the clear best choice, I suppose. In context of the others now, it feels like a bit more of a balanced Necron detachment, and one that's really focused on squads with leaders of one sort or another. The core rule being their command protocols, where any unit that's got a character leading it gets a plus one to hit. Theoretically, depending on their original ballistic skill, that would usually be a 25 to 33% damage output boost, but given that quite a lot of Necrons have effects that go off on 6s, like sustained hits or lethal hits, realistically it's going to be a little bit less than that. It's definitely not bad though, given that Necron HQs bring some pretty powerful benefits of their own. Otherwise it's also relevant for stratagems, several of which are better on units that have a character leading them, though unfortunately the Sovereign Coronal no longer counts enemies nearby as being led by characters anymore, so that won't allow you boosted access to the stratagems for things nearby that. Overall, I still think it's a strong faction rule though, and in the Codex at least one more unit got a bit more relevant for Awakened Dynasty, now you can attach a Technomancer to Wraiths, and this detachment would have them with a plus one to hit, as well as the five plus fill no pain save they'd get. Going through the stratagems, and first up we have the Protocol of the Eternal Revenant, slightly tweaked from the Index. This is the one that when an infantry character is slain, you now pay one command point and the character gets up at the end of the phase, no questions asked, with half its wounds remaining. You can only use it once per character per battle, but it's still really quite a big one to basically guarantee that the character survives, should at least get one more turn of big damage dealing in, or might survive to hold an objective or something. The change to this one was that it usually didn't actually technically happen at the end of the phase, but it seemed like that was the intent given that every other rule in 40k tends to work that way. Now though, there's no chance of your Necron Overlord just getting up from the dead, and then just suddenly getting shot down by the next thing in the gun firing queue. This one's still pretty strong, I think. Saving a character for one CP is nice. For one command point, there's Protocol of the Undying Legions. This one activates reanimation protocols for the unit after they've lost a model, and you get that boosted to a D3 plus 1 wounds back if there's a character leading the squad. I think that one's usually going to be fair enough value, Maybe particularly nice for a squad of immortals where the wounds that you're reanimating will be quite valuable ones. And it's going to be a lot more valuable if the unit in question is next to a Canoptet reanimator, getting an extra D3 wounds on top of that. If it's the difference between a squad surviving to reanimate the next turn as well, then you're potentially getting even more value. Next, for one command point, we've got the Protocol of the Hungry Void. This one's a battle tactic, so it's good for overlords. You get plus 1 strength and an extra pip of AP in melee if there's a character there. It could lead to strength 5 warriors with AP minus 1, or maybe strength 7 rays with AP minus 2. Against some targets that is going to make some pretty meaningful differences in combat. For one command point, there's the protocol of the Conquering Tyrant, again a battle tactic. This one has been changed a bit and probably for the worse, though I think maybe in reality it's more of a side grade. This one now means that your shooting gets just a re-roll hit rolls of 1, but that goes to full hit re-rolls if you happen to have a character in the unit, which I think is the only time that you probably want to use the stratagem. Previously it was full wound re-rolls, which in general is a much better buff. You typically tend to get more value out of that. Though given that Necrons like their snazzy effects going off on 6s to hit, if you have Gauss for lethal hits or Tesla, then sometimes it's going to be worth just re-rolling all the hit rolls and particularly so if you have a Plasmancer in the unit for those critical hits going off on a 5+. plus, Quite a nice one to get free with the Overlord as well, at least it makes his unit shooting reliably more powerful. Next, the Protocol of the Vengeful Stars has been changed around quite a bit. Previously this one was a sort of return fire one, where if you lost a model to enemy shooting then you could immediately fire back. Now it's one extra CP, so 2 CP here, 
and it now triggers when a Necron unit is destroyed by an enemy in the shooting phase, and then one Necron character unit within 6 inches of that can immediately shoot the unit that killed it. I guess the idea here is that if you've got a big scary Necron shooting unit, and it's nearby something that dies, it immediately just turns around and takes some big Gauss Vengeance. 2 CP is all rather pricey though, you'd have to be firing with a very meaningful threatening unit to do so, maybe some Locust Destroyers with a Locust Lord, or Heavy Destroyers, or Immortals with the target being some lighter enemy infantry. My guess is that this one's probably not going to get used very much really. Finally for 1 CP, there's the Protocol of the Sudden Storm, Ranged weapons become assault weapons, so it can be quite good for getting the squads actually moving around the board, despite slow Necron movement characteristics of 5. Very nice for getting warriors or immortals onto the midfield without compromising shooting. And just in general for bigger heavier hitters, just being able to advance and shoot might make the difference between getting a key line of sight or range on a key unit that you otherwise just couldn't reach. And then for one command point, shooting against the right target or not doing so could be worth it. Maybe not one that you want to use every turn, but occasionally that's going to be huge. Overall, some small tweaks to this one. I still say that most of the stratagems remain pretty usable and really quite strong. Really nice that these are quite so general purpose compared with a lot of the other detachment ones, though they do get better with characters, I guess. As with the index, I'm sure these will still be popular. The reactive reanimation is still quite nice, if not quite so massive on warriors. Eternal Revenant is really big to preserve a character's life, maybe particularly if they get sniped. And Conquering Tyrant seems like a reliable shooting buff, even if it has been changed from the wound reroll, it's still going to add on to damage, and Overlords can get it for free. Finally, for the Awakened Dynasty, we've got Enhancements. A few of them have been tweaked and had their names tweaked as well. The only one that seems to have stayed completely the same is the good old reliable Veil of Darkness. 20 points for a once per game teleport move, triggering at the end of the enemy's turn, I guess similar to the Hypercrypt Legion now. The unit disappears from the board, goes back into reserve, and then deep strikes back in the next turn, potentially lining up a bunch of firepower where the enemy army least likes it. Still really quite a big movement play, that one. Otherwise, the ones that have been renamed are the Nether Realm Casket, which was previously the Hyper Material Ablator. That was previously 25 points, though we're still waiting for Games Workshop's clarification on points at this point. And it might have gone down a bit, as it has lost one of its effects, it now only grants stealth to the bearer's unit, it doesn't grant cover outside of 12 inches anymore. After the two boosts, stealth was maybe the more important one, given that cover isn't the hardest thing to gain in 40k 10th. It is certainly a nerf though. Kind of a shame for the detachment, as that one added a lot of value to a durability combo. I guess maybe on certain units like Necron Warriors led by Orokin the Diviner, and another character bearing this in it, maybe it's not lost that much for those. Otherwise, we've got the Phasal Subjugator that was previously the Sovereign Coronal. The last incarnation of this one was 30 points, and this one gives Necron units within 6 inches a plus 1 to hit, though unlike the Sovereign Coronal, this one doesn't count them as being a lead unit anymore, so they won't get the boosted version of the stratagems. Still though, for any units that don't have a Necron character to lead them, it's going to be a pretty solid upgrade. Means that you could have things like Monoliths, Locust Heavy Destroyers, or Doomsday Arcs, all hitting on twos even on the move. Though it is a shame that they'll be missing out on boosted versions of some good stratagems out there. Finally, and again for some reason renames to be a different relic with exactly the same use, there's the Enagic Dermal Bond, which was previously known as the Sempaternal Weave. That was 10 points in the index for a 4 plus feel no pain type save. It's basically double durability if you didn't have a feel no pain type save already. If it remains super cheap like that, it's very usable even on infantry characters, though perhaps the next best big value target would be the Catacomb Command Barge, as unfortunately the Transcendent Catan can no longer take enhancements, though in reality that might be for the best. We'll get onto data sheets in just a second, but the Catan all gained a 5 plus feel no pain just at base anyway. I guess it was a bit strange having every second Necron list run that specific Transcendent Catan with the 10 point weave upgrades, to auto include double its durability. Overall, I guess technically three of these did get some nerfs in one way or another, but I feel like it's still literally every one of these four is still very playable and strong. Even if they remain the same points cost, I'm sure that lists will still be taking them, and they might get some slight reductions given that their abilities have gone down for some of them. Overall, I feel like broadly, if you liked the Awakened Dynasty before, then you'll still like it now. It's not really changed that way in the important ways, has had a couple of side grades and one upgrade with the characters resurrecting at the end of the phase. 
for a lot of people's armies without the specific models needed to make the other detachments work in a big way, it's still going to be the go-to for a lot of people, I still think that it's going to be strong in comparison with the rest. Obviously it's very early days and first impressions at the moment, depending on what Games Workshop charges points for which units could really swing the power in favour of one or the others, but given if the units kept the similar sort of points cost to what they had now, I feel like the Canoptech Court seems to stand out strong literally all around, and besides that I feel like the Hypercrypt Legion and the Awakened Dynasty really have some big selling points. The Abasence Phalanx I think has some interesting stuff, though maybe just feels like it has overall less to add compared with the rest of these. And aside from fast rush score pecs and a crown that makes you not want to fall back very much, the Annihilation Legion I think is sadly lacking, and probably still to the extent where if you're playing Destroyer Heavy Necrons you might still be tempted to pick up the Awakened Dynasty instead. Guess we'll see how things go though, it might be fun to take a look at one or more of these in their own video at some point in the future. That's very much only half the story though, as Codex Necrons has had really quite a lot of datasheet changes, some buffs, some nerfs, and some flat out added or removed. Just for a few of the general trends of the army, the battle line units are the warriors and the immortals still, so you can take more of those if you'd wanted to, though I think it's going to be a rare list that really wants to take more than three units of each. Maybe if you're doing some sort of funny immortal damage dealing spam, led by a bunch of cryptex or something in Canoptech Court. Otherwise, general thing is for Necron attacks, Gauss means lethal hits. Feels like about the most appropriate use for that rule as it chips away at everything out there, dissolving the foe at a molecular level. Tesla gets sustained hits too, so big arcing sixes get lots of stack saves on the enemy with AP0. The particle weapons generally get devastating wounds, and vehicle quantum shielding is still currently represented by 4 plus invulnerable saves that you get on most of the vehicles besides the flyers and the monolith and a few others. Otherwise, leadership for the faction perhaps remains surprisingly low. Standard Necron units tend to get a leadership of 7, so are fairly easy to confuse their subroutines or whatever unless there's a noble around. Plenty of the leader characters with a bit more sentience have 6s. Canoptech units are down to leadership 8, so they can't be relied on objectives when they're damaged really. For the most part, the army generally tends to be fairly slow and ponderous without enormous amounts of super zippy units. So in the Codex update, a few things gained plus one to their movement characteristics, a lot of the things that sort of move mid-level, say like Scorpec Destroyers or Wraiths. Otherwise, I thought we'd talk through datasheets that have either gone away or been added in, and then just talk through a few of the really biggest changes for the datasheets, and go through them all one by one with what's changed specifically. First up, as Games Workshop have previously teased, the number of datasheets has dropped a bit. There were 50 and now there's 47. They have added in a different datasheet for the Overlord with that new fancy translocation shroud. He has got his own datasheet, but it does mean that four of the older Necron models have been retired. It looks like a chunk of the fine cast characters have gone away and will likely go to Legends, so that's Amrakir the Traveller with his immortal buffs, Nemesor of Zandrek and Vargard Oberon as the pair, and the regular Necron Lord on foot, kind of a shame for him seeing as he is an absolutely classic miniature, it just seems a bit odd to have the standard Necron Lieutenant basically mothballed, it just feels like he should have been a fairly high priority one to get a release, particularly as Games Workshop has released rather a lot of Overlords, and things like Primaris Lieutenants have got a fair bit too much representation compared with what they need. I feel like the fine cast characters were generally kind of niche and not run all that much, though obviously people have absolutely great love for their lore, maybe they'll return at some point in the future, but maybe the biggest competitive hit for the Necrons is the standard Lord, it was a nice cheap way to get a leader character in a unit, a little bit of extra movement plus a resurrection orb, I guess it's going to be an overlord if you want the resurrection orb now, which might be a bit awkward if you've got more than one on the board and you don't need them for the battle tactics as you can only use that once per turn. Otherwise, the ones that get a lucky escape at least this time round are Trazen the Infinite and the Locust Lord, I think Necron players would have been even more unhappy if Trazen had gone away seeing as he is a much loved character. I'd guess there's at least some chance that Games Workshop redo his miniature at some point, seeing as they redid Oricon, and it would be a bit harsh not to redo both sides of the Infinite and the Divine at some point. And the Locust Lord somehow managed to survive despite not actually having a kit on sale right now. Again, I guess that's probably because they're planning a release for him at some stage. It just seems hard to imagine that they wouldn't have redesigned the Locust Destroyers and the Destroyer Lord at the time of doing the Heavy Destroyers but we might not see them until the next major Necron release. 
competitively, Trazin is kind of whatever. They're still giving him awful rules, but the Locust Lord does seem pretty relevant in multiple detachments, bringing enhancements to some very threatening units. Otherwise, before we jump into the data sheets, here's just a quick list of the most major changes in my opinion. There is certainly a lot more than this and some other very cool stuff or some disappointing stuff, but here are just a few of the highlights. The Catan Shards in general gained a 5 plus feel no pain, though they are a bit slower than they were, just moving 6 inches now. Can't help but think that that might come hand in hand with a points increase for those guys. That is just effectively adding an extra 50% durability, basically for free for them, so I wouldn't be too surprised if they went up a little bit. They could still be very strong even if they did. A 5 plus feel no pain and half damage is kind of monstrous. Otherwise, as mentioned, lots of mid-movement units, things that moved between 7 or 9 inches, generally gains plus 1. Lots of things either move 8 inches or 10 inches now. A big change to character attachments is that Cryptex of all flavours can't leech Lich Guard, so Crypto Thralls also can't join the unit either. Between that and the reanimation changes, it does feel like the big Lich Guard durability death ball might be kind of hard to justify. Though hopefully if so, that could be motivation for sending their points back down to what they were. On the reanimation front, I did mention it at the start of the video, but Necron Warriors are way worse for that. They only get to re-roll the dice for it, and their Gauss Reapers also became Strength 4, which will not be popular. The Resurrection Orb is now just a once per game D6 wounds reanimated. I'd say that's a bit of a trade-off. Overall, likely not as strong as reanimating every command phase, particularly if there's a reanimator nearby. But at least there's some advantage to front-loading it a bit, just in case your unit was about to get wiped out anyway. And the Canoptic Reanimator actually needs to be a lot closer to its charges, moving to just a 3-inch range down from a 12-inch range, so it's a lot more likely to get in harm's way. Again, could be pretty reasonable that they could reduce points due to that. I did think its area of effect was perhaps weirdly big before, though maybe it might have been nicer if they went for a mid-level and went for a 6-inch range. Otherwise, for weapon classes, the Necron Particle weapons generally tended to hit on a 2+, plus before. Really not sure why that was the case, really, but now they generally hit on 3s, though a few of them still have better ballistic skill than you'd expect. And otherwise, for maybe a few more notably buffed or improved units, Scorpate Destroyers get 4 hit rolls in melee on the charge, Wraiths get an extra wound, the Royal Warden gets 2 fall back and shoots, though did lose the Assault thing. Locust Destroyers gain some full rerolls if they target the closest unit and that unit's on an objective. Tomb Blades have an intriguing move shoot move, though lost some survivability. And the Big Bad Tesseract Vault now gets two Katarn powers rather than one, so an improvement there. Overall, it is a bit of a mixed bag. I think I would spare going too heavy on the interpretation until points costs come out. It's genuinely possible that things that look like they're buffed could actually wind up nerfed if their points crank up too much, or conversely, things that look nerfed could be actually really very strong. Let's jump into the datasheets proper though, and we'll start off with a new one, then we'll go for Necron squads, Canoptex and vehicles, then characters, and wrap up with some Forge World things. First up, our Overlord with the Translocation Shroud, basically has the exact same stat line as a regular Overlord, Toughness 5, 6 wounds with his 2+, plus and 4+, plus invul save, and he has the same keywords, he does not get fly or anything like that. Essentially, he really is pretty much the same datasheet as the standard Overlord, he gets the Overlord's Blaze, which is the sort of warside type profile, 4 attacks at strength 8, AP 3, damage 2 with devastating wounds, and he does come with a Resurrection Orb thrown into the bargain. Now, as mentioned, with that once per game, D6 wounds reanimated at the end of one phase. He gets My Will Be Done for the same 0 CP stratagem, very helpful if you've got good battle tactics and units to use it. It could be quite nice for the Devastating Wounds one in Canoptic Court, for example. And really the only thing that's different about him is this Translocation Shroud. This allows you to auto-advance 6 inches with your unit, and then also if you make any normal advance or fallback moves, you get to move through enemy models and terrain for no penalty. The rule that that's replacing is the minus 1 damage one that the standard Overlord gets, which I think is fine enough, but I'd probably say that this one is more impactful. It means that if you have a squad that isn't going to be dealing some direct damage this turn, they can just move really quite fast and get themselves into the midfield. Seems nice for Lich Guard or Warriors or something like that. I guess points remain to be seen, and he does pass up some war gear options like that Void Scythe or the Tachyon Arrow should you wish that over a Net Resurrection Orb, but overall if he costs roughly the same as a regular Overlord, I could see him being run in preference. Beyond the new datasheet though, let's move on to the squads. As mentioned, the Necron Warriors have taken a hit, 
They're your standard Legion battle line with toughness 4, a 4 plus save, and objective control 2. Striking with the lethal hits of the Gauss Flayer or Gauss Reaper, the Gauss Flayer being rapid fire out to 24 inches, the Gauss Reaper being 2 shots at 12 inches, though now it's only strength 4 AP minus 1 when previously it was strength 5. Now that's changed, I really feel like the two are a lot more balanced than they were previously, before I would have easily said that the Reaper was better. It's basically whether you want a lot more threat with the extra AP within 12 inches, or to have some semblance of threat beyond that. Their damage output isn't spectacular, and unfortunately their reanimation is significantly worse than it was before as well. He now just gets to re-roll the reanimation rolls, so that's usually going to average you 2.3 wounds worth of Necrons returned, and that is massively less than the previous used to be. If you're on an objective, previously you were averaging 5 wounds returned every single time you reanimated, and that could be including reactive reanimations and things. Overall, the unit certainly is weaker. Hopefully Games Workshop might have mercy on them and drop their points by a little bit. I think they could credibly go down to at least 10 like that. I guess the Necron Warriors being reined in might leave a bit more room for the Immortals. Their previous points cost was 70, though we don't know what it is now yet and you get between 5 and 10 in the unit rather than the 10 to 20 of the warriors. These guys are a bit sturdier, toughness 5 with a 3 plus save that will like being in cover, and both profiles are interesting enough I think. A gauss blaster with 2 attacks out to 24 inches with lethal hits, strength 5 and AP 1. And the tesla carbine gets 2 shots now out to 24 inches, so plus 6 inches compared with the 18 inches it was before, and they get sustained hits too and the assault keyword as well, so they can move around the board quite rapidly. It means you could have them zooming around the board 11 inches and then still firing with that translocation overlord. Otherwise their special rule is implacable eradication. Each time you make an attack you get to re-roll a wound roll of 1, or if you're hitting something on an objective marker you get to fully re-roll the wound roll instead. It means they're going to stack a whole load of AP0 saves. It can be quite big if they could gain the devastating wounds that you get from that Canoptec court say if you had an overlord and a crypt tech in the unit. Overall I would say they've probably gained on warriors a bit, they'll likely be reanimating more value back onto the board compared with warriors, now that it's a lot more balanced and the warriors don't have enormous advantages with how much they bring back. Next up we've got the Lich Guard, which prior to the codex were 115 points per 5, more usually fielded in bricks of 10 though for 230 for 10 of them, usually with maximal support. The Necron Elites are really quite tanky, 2 wounds at toughness 5 and usually fielded with the hyperphase sword for a bunch of strength 6 and AP 2 attacks which also gives them the 4 plus invulnerable save from their dispersion shield. They do also have the more damage dealer option of the war scythe with fewer attacks at strength 8, AP 3 and damage 2 plus devastating wounds. Realistically I feel like that might be less far behind than a lot of people would imagine but typically for Necrons durability tends to win out. Lichgard have taken some heavy nerfs though, they can no longer be joined by Cryptex, so you can't get things like the 5 plus feel no pain from the Technomancer, which is very sad for them, and their core rule with the minus 1 to wound when you've got a character in the unit, previously that was just against any attack against them, now it's only against things where the strength is greater than their toughness, so they won't make strength 4 things almost irrelevant against them anymore. Overall feels like they're probably going to be struggling as a role as a durable linchpin unit anymore, I feel like they can't just laugh off most damage output in the game and then grow back with reanimation. Hopefully as a result their points could go down a little bit so the Games Workshop doesn't have to try and break that combo. And they're still a big tanky high investment unit that could be pretty interesting in multiple different detachments. Maybe the Abasance Phalanx more than most given that that really builds around their keyword. The Triad Praetorians feel like they've got a lot going for them again in multiple different detachments here. Abasance helps them out. And it could be fun warping on and off the board with the Hypercrypt formation. They did seem to be seeing some competitive play already. They're quite nice infantry skirmishers with the Particle Casters and the Void Blades. For their changes, the Particle Weapons no longer hit on a 2+, so a small damage drop there. But they have gained a bit of mobility, jumping up to movement 10 from movement 9. Otherwise, fairly tanky with 2 wounds at toughness 5. They've got the choice of the more anti-infantry Void Blade and Particle Caster, or a bunch of strength 5 AP 2 and damage 2 attacks from the Rod of the Covenant in shooting and melee. And for their special rules you get 2 reroll charge rolls which I guess is okay at giving you a little bit more reliability getting in from deep strike. And then you can also fall back and charge as well so they're hard to pin down. Not being able to be led by any leaders though is a bit of a disadvantage. It does limit a few synergies that they could otherwise have. 
Next up, we've got the Sinister Death Marks, the same sort of profile as an Immortal with one wound at Toughness 5, and their digital points before the Codex were 13 points per model, so 65 for 5 of them. These guys are a really nice cheap units to deep strike in and do secondary objectives, and then threaten some actually genuinely credible damage. They each get a shot at Strength 5, AP 2, Damage 2, with the Precision Keyword and Ballistic Skill 3 even on the move. They get plus 1 to hit by a heavy if they're static. They can do a kind of fun ability to intercept some enemy reserves, to jump in and get a round of shooting at them after the enemy is set up. I guess occasionally that could cause your opponent problems if they want to bring something really quite fragile onto the board, maybe a lone character deep striking. In any case, at the 13 points that they were before, I felt like they were quite an efficient unit, cheap secondary things and a little bit of damage. And if you're playing the Hypercrypt formation, they seem like a pretty ideal unit. You could have big units of them just jumping around the board and then disappearing after they've killed their target, only to appear on you to shoot down the next one. I guess Strength 5 might limit their potential a bit against really tough stuff though. The Horrific Flayed ones were previously 14 points per model, so 70 for 5 of them. These guys can infiltrate and start up the board. For units with midfield presence, I guess it's either these guys or the Tomb Blades that are usually the go-to, as Tomb Blades have Scout. The Flayed ones have a Necron Warrior defensive profile, with Toughness 4, 1 wound and a 4 plus save. They do have stealth for a little bit more durability against shooting, and then their damage output in combat with their flare claws is actually genuinely quite good against most lighter infantry type units. Anything that's toughness 4 or less is actually going to take some serious damage with them, including space marines, despite them only being damage 1. They really go through hordes like nobody's business. Between sustained hits, twin linked, 4 attacks at strength 4, AP 1, you average 3 dead intercessors from a unit of just 5 of these, never mind things that are a bit squishier. Their flesh onto rule gives them critical hits against units that are less than half strength, which is nice but kind of rare. And I feel like they're usable enough in small numbers, the main downside being that they're kind of fragile for a forward deploy unit, might just get gunned down or taken out early without much recourse. I guess maybe their primary competition is either the Tomb Blades with their fun move shoot move shenanigans now, or the Canoptic Acanthrites from Forge World. I guess in Annihilation Legion, they'd have a fair few more options. At least they're a credible melee threat, even if they're not very tough and can't deal with the toughest stuff in the game. Lastly, for the infantry squads, we have the Cryptothrals, a small unit of two murder buckets that can join a squad at the same time as a Cryptek does, previously costing 60 points in the index, and they were often used as particularly valuable things to reanimate and restore some very tanky wounds to the board. In this incarnation, they've had a bit of a durability downgrade in my opinion. Their toughness 4 with a 3 plus save, previously they had 2 wounds and a 4 plus feel no pain, which in general is going to be flatly better than 3 wounds without a feel no pain, so for the most part they will just go down easier now. On top of that, reanimating a wound without a 4 plus feel no pain is less valuable, so you're not getting quite as much toughness back on the board if you choose to reanimate these guys now. Otherwise, they add a little bit of threat with some close range 6 inch shooting with their scouring eye, and then a few more strength 5 AP1 attacks in combat with the limbs. They make an attached cryptech harder to snipe when they're in the unit with a feel no pain, and if they're slain, then they get to fight on death on a 3 plus, which could allow a little bit of strike back, though their damage is only going to be good against lighter stuff. Honestly, I can't really see a lot of people taking these if they do remain at 60 points. I'd hope that they'd go down a bit to reflect their new toughness and the fact that they won't be able to be joining Lichgar blocks anymore as the Cryptex can't. Next up, we have the Tomb Blades, which got some of the biggest changes out of the data sheets. Pre Codex, there were 80 points for three of them, and people often use them as scouting outriders as they have scout nine inches just to get some presence on midfield objectives and be in a position to do secondaries if needed. They move 12 inches, have a toughness 5 with a 4 plus save, and 2 wounds, so maybe aren't enormously tough per the cost, but it does look like they're going to be more fragile but also have more shenanigans. First up, they've lost the minus 1 to hit that they had, so that will definitely make them easier to wipe out, and their shield veins are now more of a choice. Previously you got them for free and they just upgraded the save to a 3 plus, so they were essentially also include. Now if you do take shield veins then you lose some movement, you drop down from 12 inches to 8 inch move, and that's really quite a lot less, so much so that it might be tempting just not to take them, unless you're just having them hover around and pinging in and out of cover for small amounts of damage at longer range. Otherwise they can regain a minus 1 to hit at range only with the shadow loom, 
They have to weigh that up versus the Nebula scope that gives them ignore cover. Previously, the Shadow Loom was a 5 plus invulnerable save, and I think genuinely it is a fairly even trade off between those two now. They're both quite good. I think I might be more tempted by the minus one to hit, but I could see the advantage of the other one. Finally, for their most interesting special rule that they gained, they now have evasion engrams. That allows them a normal move of 6 inches after shooting in your shooting phase. So you could potentially have some Tomb Blades move out, shoot the enemy and then hide behind cover. Or just use that extra move to go in a straight line. Potentially they could be moving 18 inches towards doing an objective. Otherwise they've got a choice of guns between the Particle Beamer and Twin Gauss or Tesla. I genuinely think that they're kind of well balanced and aren't the biggest deal in the world which one you go for out of those. Just very slightly different flavours of infantry killing. I guess having move, shoot, move, you might be a bit more tempted by one that's got 24 inch range, just to make sure you can actually shoot. Overall, lots of changes to those guys. Could be interesting to have scout up, and then move, shoot, moving to try and be on objectives while staying safe, and just be a bit of a nuisance for the opponent to have to, have to move up and try and deal with if they want to take the objectives. Next up, to perhaps one of the more improved units in the Codex, are the Canoptech Wraiths. Unless these guys have gone up by loads, these are looking good. Melee murder machines that were previously 110 points for 3 of them. They move up the board with 10 inches now rather than 9. They're genuinely quite tanky with toughness 6, a 3 plus save and a 4 plus invulnerable. And they've gone up from 3 wounds to 4 wounds which is big. And they can now be led by Technomancers for a 5 plus fail no pain and healing within the unit. Plus bearing various enhancements and giving them plus 1 to hit in Awakened Dynasty. Between all that that's really quite a lot. I'd arm them with the Vicious Claws with the 4 attacks at Strength 6, AP 1 and Damage 2. Certainly not stellar damage, but I guess they're more of a fast moving, durable sort of annoyance unit. And they can have a bit of a sting in the tail with the Particle Caster or Transdimensional Beamer. The Particles do hit on a 4 plus rather than a 2 now though. Otherwise they've also got a Mortal Wound Sweep attack after they've moved a normal move over the enemy. Just a 50-50 chance per Wraith in the unit, so not going to add up to that much, but occasionally that will put you in a position where you can do a little bit of extra damage. Overall feels like a bit more of a return to form for them, maybe back how they were in previous days. Tough enough to be a nuisance, even if they do take some serious enemy firepower. And of course these guys are just absolutely going to love the Canoptic Court with the full reroll hits it can bring, plus the potential to infiltrate the unit. For the Scarabs, these guys were previously 40 points per 3 bases, and broadly I think they've got a little bit better, although their self-destruct rule has got a little bit more tame. The Scarabs get 4 wounds per base at just toughness 2 and a 6 plus save, they move a big 10 inches, and they hit you with whole load of strength 2 attacks that hit on 5s, but they do get lethal hits, so will likely just stack a few saves on most enemies, if not very many. Their melee does actually seem like it could be somewhat credible in Canoptech Court as well. Just re-roll everything that isn't a 6 and you're pretty much guaranteed to get a few saves for the enemy. Otherwise their swarm rule means that you subtract 1 from enemy objective control if they're in melee with them. Now that's been improved slightly so if there's a Cryptech nearby within 6 inches then they get plus 1 objective control themselves so they can actually hold points as usually their objective control 0. Their self-destruct rule I still think is useful in melee. In a combat, if it makes sense, you can nominate a Scarab Swarm to self-destruct. Roll a dice and on a 2 plus, you get D3 mortal wounds on the enemy. And on a 6, you get 3 mortal wounds. That previously was a big D3 plus 3, so that's been reined in a little bit there. Overall, still seems good. If they're still 40 points, then that's a nice screening and utility unit. Even at objective control 0, it means they're fairly ideal for doing secondary objectives. Never mind potentially messing with folks on primaries. Which particularly if you're in the Canoptech court and there's loads of Cryptex about, then maybe you could do that a bit more credibly. Next we've got the Locust Destroyers. These were 30 points each before and you could take them in squads anywhere between 1 and 6, just provided you don't take specifically 4 or 5 of them. They're toughness 6, 3 wounds with a 3 plus save. They now move 8 inches with Fly, though they do have the mounted keyword, which means they're going round things like ruins, not just ghosting through them. And they're armed with a fairly fearsome Gauss Cannon. 3 shots at strength 5, AP 2 and damage 2 at 24 inch range, all with lethal hits, generally very nice at killing space marines, lethal hits will still mean that they're a threat to tougher things out there. Their main improvement is that their re-rolls have got a bit better, they previously had the rule where if they were shooting at the closest enemy they get to re-roll hit rolls of 1, now they get the further boost that if that enemy is on an objective marker they get to re-roll all hit rolls. 
That is going to be a bit situational as to whether or not that can get lined up, but it definitely combos rather well with lethal hits. If you were going to be wounding on a 5 or a 6, then you could just re-roll everything to get as many 6s as possible and just drown the enemy in auto wounds. Overall, I think that these guys are shaping up to be interesting. They feel like they make very good use of the Hypercrypt Legion and also could be interesting for that criticals on 5 plus ability of the Obeisance Phalanx. Potentially could save yourself points on the Locust Lord there. Their bigger brothers are the Locust Heavy Destroyers, Pretty much the same idea, but 4 wounds rather than 3. They generally are a little bit less durable per point though, given that these guys cost 50 and the other ones 30 previously. They also gained the 8 inch move along with the regular locusts, and they have the choice of the Enmity Exterminator, 6 shots with another 6 at 18 inch range, at sustained hits 1, strength 6, AP 1 and damage 1. They have the heavy keyword and get to reroll wound rolls of 1 against anything that isn't a monster or vehicle. Previously that was just infantry. Otherwise there's the big and utterly terrifying Gauss Destructor, just the one shots to 48 inch range with a massive strength 14 AP4 damage 6, again heavy and that one has lethal hits. Specialising in killing heavies, that one also gets to re-roll wound rolls of 1 against monsters and vehicles. I still think that these guys are likely to be pretty exciting damage dealers in plenty of formations. Again could be fun to be warping around the board in the Hypercrypt Legion. Maybe it could be interesting for the new Vengeful Stars one in the Awakens Dynasty. And could be nice to hit on a 2 plus on the move with the Sovereign Coronals new version in that formation as well. Overall I'm a bit more tempted by the massive great big Gauss weapons compared with the Emmitics. Though I certainly have seen people use the damage 1 option as well. You do get a truly enormous ton of shots. For the melee flavour of destroyers we have the Scorpex. These guys were 100 points per 3 before. Toughness 6 with 3 wounds and a 3 plus save again. They've also been boosted to an 8 inch move which is very good for a dedicated melee unit. I'll get there just a little bit faster and make more charges. And they fight in combat with 4 attacks at strength 7, AP 2 and damage 2. The plasma sight that they get for free can give them a once per game devastating wounds. And these guys got a nice buff that I think will put them towards the stronger end of melee units again. Previously they had a, I thought a fairly bad ignores modifier rule. It came up but situationally, whereas now they get Whirling Onslaught, which is re-roll hit rolls of 1 just in general, and then re-roll all hit rolls on the charge, so effectively a big 33% damage output boost there very reliably. That will also confer to the Scorpec Lord as well, and if you have a Scorpec Lord in the units, then that could give you more chance of getting lethal hits if it did make sense to fish for them against a tough target the wounding on a 5+. plus. Overall, unless they ruin their points cost, I'd expect these guys to see more play, they do seem to be pretty much the unit for Annihilation Legion, and otherwise just a unit of them with a Scorpet Lord could be a massive threat, particularly for any enhancements or any big stratagems that you can use on them. The Aphidian Destroyers are kind of similar in a lot of ways in profile, they're just generally a bit weedier with Toughness 5 and a 4 plus save, and they get more attacks with their Hyperphase weapons, but they're only Strength 4. They trade out a lot of their threats just for their utility though, they can deep strike in to do secondary objectives, move 10 inches when they're on the board, and perhaps most importantly their tunnelling horror special rule allows them to return to reserves in the enemy turn, so it can give you the option of deep strikes later in the game. Lots of people maybe use one or two units of these for things like secondary objectives, though I do feel like they are a little bit on the pricey side for that role for something that the enemy can shoot directly. They seem like they're going to be a very relevant unit in the Annihilation Legion in particular, given that they get to re-roll charges. They could actually have them threatening enemies with a little bit more of a reliable charge out of Deep Strike, and they feel like they're conversely a unit that is super redundant in the Hypercrypt Legion, as basically that entire Legion can do their trick for free. On to the Necron Vehicle datasheets next, and we'll start out with the Annihilation Barge. This one's a slightly odd, relatively high strength and damage gun turret, but with only AP0. A twin Tesla destructor with 6 attacks at strength 8, AP0, damage 2, and sustained hits 2 and twin links. It's definitely going to stack some big saves at damage 2, but AP0 means that a lot of enemy units can just shrug that off unless they roll really badly. Otherwise you get to back that up with either a Tesla or Gauss cannon on the hull, and I'd rate the vehicle at kind of medium durability. Toughness 8 with 9 wounds but a big 4 plus invulnerable save, and the only major datasheet change here is that it moves 10 inches rather than 9. Its special rule is that malevolent arcing one, 
It means that any unit within three inches of its first target on a five plus will take an extra D3 mortal wounds. Overall, I'd say it's kind of all right. Maybe not one of the things that people most tend to gravitate to. Generally, if you're adding big guns into the army, it's often to try and deal with heavy hitters. This thing is a bit disappointing in coping with enemy tanks. I can definitely throw a stack of saves to roll on things like more medium infantry. I might get a bit of splash damage with the arcing thing. On the other hand, the Necron Goron turret that absolutely can handle really big tough stuff is the Doomsday Arc. Previously this was 210 points, and is a bit tougher than the Annihilation Barge at a big 14 wounds, again with the 4 plus invulnerable. The primary weapon is the Doomsday Cannon, D6 plus 1 shots with Blast and Heavy, Strength 18 now, up 3 from 15, AP 4 and Damage 4. That means it's wounding things that are toughness 8 or 9 on a 2 plus now. It'll be hitting on 2s with devastating wounds from its special rule if it remains stationary, though it's still a lot more effective on the move than it was back in 9th edition, and it comes with a couple of banks of Gauss Flare arrays to put some hurt on lighter infantry that venture a bit too close. Again, kind of fine as extra long-range fire support. Given a few turns to fire at the enemy, this will definitely put a lot of damage on the heaviest tanks that they have. Next, we've got the Triarch Stalker that got a couple of interesting upgrades. I say this one was a relatively niche unit before, toughness 8, 12 wounds with the same 4 plus invulnerable, so at least relatively tough I'd say, and then it had close range shooting that isn't really all that great for the points, but one thing that it shot the rest of your army gets to ignore cover against. The slightly odd change that this one's got is that it's gained scout 8 inches, so it gets to move forward into the midfield, I guess that could be good for getting the cover debuff, plus it's closer range shooting into the fray but it doesn't exactly feel like the absolute optimal thing that you most want taking damage on the front line or getting into combat. It does have a little bit of attacks with those stalker forelimbs, but not very much. Overall, a bit of a weird unit all around, I'd say. One other improvement that I noticed was that the twin heavy gauss cannon now gets 6 attacks at strength 8, AP 2, damage 2. It's lost the twin links rule for just flat more attacks. That's kind of nice as it's changed it from just being underwhelming against pretty much everything to actually being genuinely quite good at killing space marines and will still be able to put a little bit of damage on heavier stuff. I feel like this would still have to be kind of cheap to attract attention though. I suppose one of them could be alright to hand out the cover debuff in a really shooting focused army. Maybe in hypercrypts. Getting on to the Canoptech vehicles next and first up we have the Doomstalker often the rival of the Doomsday Arc to get picked in lists. This guy's pretty much unchanged from what he was before, just an extra pip of movement up to 8 inches, and otherwise a toughness 8 walker with 12 wounds, the 4 plus invulnerable save, and a slightly slims down version of the Doomsday Cannon, the Doomsday Blaster, D6 plus 1 shots but only strength 14, AP 3 and damage 3. Nowhere near as overwhelming and hits on 4s, though still at least reasonably balanced in terms of damage output. Otherwise it's got some auxiliary twin gas flares and can overwatch on a 5 plus should you choose to. Even with that though it's perhaps a bit borderline for 1 CP. This thing will absolutely love the Canoptech court formation though. Just holding the line at the edge of your deployment zone or moving into the midfield should allow you full hit rerolls basically all game long. Never mind other potential tricks that you might be able to use with it like suddenly shielding it from return enemy fire when it matters. Definitely going to be just ridiculously stronger there than in other places. The Canoptech Reanimator we've already touched on a couple of times. The big thing for this guy was that the reanimation dropped from a big 12 inches to 3 inches for the one nominated unit that get the extra D3 wounds restored. Means that it might well be having to venture its way into the midfield alongside the Warriors or Lich Guard or whatever else it's buffing and maybe exposing itself to firepower which even with a 4 plus feel no pain isn't going to be great with only toughness 6 and 6 wounds. It doesn't really have all that much threat of its own, an atomizer beam for a few strength 6 attacks, but I guess hopefully if it's losing this much utility it might well get a points drop. I feel like you justify the premium for when it could just sit in a backfield ruin and just mind its own business, now it's got to stalk forward, hopefully it could drop down a bit. The Canoptic Spider previously was 75 points and it can take them in units of 1 or 2, Again, it's going to be a unit that's massively good in the Canoptech court. For 75 points, you get a mid-toughness monster. Toughness 7 with 6 wounds and a 3 plus save. Maybe durability being a bit of a lower point than most. But then beyond that, I feel like it does bring really quite a lot of generalised stuff to the table. 
two particle beamers for some anti-infantry shooting with two copies of Blast, which is always nice, automaton claws for some genuinely okay melee, strength 8, AP 2 and damage 2. I feel like between those two, if you get the hit re-rolls from the court, then its damage output is seriously savage, even in just one turn. But then it's also got a trio of different supporting rules, healing up scarabs if there happens to be a depleted unit nearby, a fabricated claw array to give a 6 plus feel no pain to units within 6 inches, including itself, and the gloom prism which has seen a slight side grade, is traded from a 4 plus feel no pain against psychic attacks, to a 5 plus against both psychic attacks and also mortal wounds as well. I feel like overall that's not too bad though, less truly enormous against heavy psychic damage armies like Thousand Sons or maybe Tyranid Zone Thropes, but more useful against a few more tricks of some other armies. Again, extra consideration in Canoptech Court, could still be interesting in a vehicle heavy Necron list otherwise, getting just a 6 plus feel no pain on a monolith might well be worth it, if you can keep it at least somewhat safe while delivering that buff. Next up for the Necron Transport Arc, we have the Ghost Arc. This one's got the same profile as the Doomsday Arc and moves 10 inches. It's packing the same gas flare arrays, but its main purpose is of course to transport 10 Necron Warriors into battle and up to one attached character. A reasonable enough solution to move the Necron Warriors reliably onto a central objective turn 1, have them get out, and then when they're shot it gets to repair them a bit with its Repair Barge special rule. This will be less good than it was before though, as previously the warriors will get their boosted reanimation, and now they only have the kind of sad reroll number of wounds. Overall it will be a bit less valuable as a result. I feel like it's going to need to be a bit cheaper to really get as much attention when it's transporting warriors that don't hit as hard with strength 4 gauss flayers, and also don't reanimate as well. Next up for the Necron Space Croissant Air Force, first up we have the Doom Scythe, Previously 225 points for a 12 wound flyer with toughness 9, it doesn't have the hover keyword so it must start the game off the board. Its main purpose in life is to deliver heavy death ray shooting to enemy tanks and armour, 36 inches with 3 shots at strength 16, AP 4 and damage D6 plus 1, plus with flyer reserve rules and really quite good movement the opponent's going to struggle to hide from this too much. It also gets sustained hits D3 on those attacks, and a twin Tesla Destructor which puts a whole load of stack saves on other enemy units at AP0. The biggest change for this guy is that its primary special rule now affects all units, the Atavistic Instigation. That's the one that basically means that your opponent has to choose between docking for cover or standing firm, choosing to either take a minus 1 to hit or get the sustained hits D3 to go off on a 5+. plus. The change to that rule means that it now applies to all units, not just infantry units, as usually you'd not really want to target the big death ray at infantry units, as it's kind of a waste versus hitting tanks. Kind of funny to think of something like a Night Titan or Land Raider docking for cover somehow, I suppose it means evasive manoeuvres. Overall not awful, and it certainly got a little bit better, a small points reduction compared with previously though I think wouldn't be the worst for it, it was a bit on the niche side. The Night Scythe is the transport version of the flyer, that has the same defensive profile and same Tesla Destructor but no Death Ray, instead it transports one Necron Infantry unit and has an interesting special rule where you can warp Necron units back up into it at the end of the fight phase with its big translocation beams. Previously perhaps the single biggest problem with this was that it couldn't turn up until turn 2 and that meant that you wouldn't be getting a unit out of it until turn 3. But now Games Workshop seem to have fixed that, it's got a special rule allowing it to turn up to the board any time from battle round 1, 2 or 3. Being able to turn up round 1 is kind of nice, means that you could potentially set up a unit for a big disembark sometime turn 2, or even just scoop a unit off the board turn 1 and have them ready to deploy from the night side. Not sure whether or not that's still going to be worth the price of admission or not, the enemies would still be able to know its flight path perfectly as it's locked and could just move things to make things difficult for the unit getting out, but it's definitely a lot better looking than it was before. Super Heavy is next, and the Mighty Monolith was 350 points previously. Overall I did think it wasn't the worst deal as Super Heavies go, fairly tanky with a massive toughness profile with a 2 plus save. In the new codex things have shifted around a little bit, it's now only toughness 13 not 14, but it has gone up to 22 wounds, Against the vast majority of things, that's not going to be a big deal. Things like last cannons will still be wounding it on a 5+, plus, and there's not a whole load of stuff that's either strength 7 or strength 14 out there. 
I think I'd rather have the two extra wounds against the majority of the field for the most part. Otherwise it moves a little bit faster at 8 inches. Gets a nice general purpose attack with its particle whip at 24 inches. And then usually a bunch of death rays to back that up with a big damage D6 plus 1. It certainly gets some good threat in melee as well with some weirdly accurate attacks from its portal of exile. And has the fun eternity gate special rule to warp necron units back to it. As mentioned quite a bit already, it seems to be almost auto-include in Hypercrypt Legion with all the extra options that it allows you, and anything that can be used to buff or affect it is generally going to be quite strong given it's a big, dangerous and fairly tanky unit. Things like Canoptic Spiders for Feel No Pain, or something with the new version of the Sovereign Coronal for a plus one to hit. Next up we've got the Obelisk, which Games Workshop would very much need to discount into the dirt before people would take it. Previously it was 325 points and attacks with a bunch of Tesla spheres, 6 attacks each with sustained hits at anti-fly 4+, good at clearing out lighter infantry and can stack some saves on space marines and things, but still not really quite enough threat for plus 300 points of model. Like the monolith, this lost a bit of toughness but gained 2 wounds, moved a little bit faster, and to try and make it a little bit more tempting, Games Workshop have given it a better debuffing rule. Its Gravitic Pulse now halves your movement, advance and charge, rather than just minuses 2 from it. I feel like that does go some way from tipping the balance from it being just a mild nuisance to being seriously quite disruptive. You could keep a scary enemy melee unit out of the fight with that, though I still think it's going to be a hard sell to pay this much of your army just in a big durability unit without that much threat to anything particularly scary. Despite it being a bit of a meme at this point, if it does keep a similar sort of points value, I think it's actually getting to a place where it's really not as bad as it has been in the past. It's certainly not going to kill anything, but if you just park Objective Control 8 on a midfield objective, start slowing down enemy damage dealers, and still hoovering up any lighter stuff quite easily with those Teslas, people are going to be kind of annoyed by how hard it actually is to kill. 24 wounds at toughness 13 for just over 300 points is a bit of a problematic amount of durability. Definitely would need pairing with some things to pick up the slack on the damage dealing front though. Next up for the Tesseract Vault, that seems to have gone even more into damage. Previously that was 375 points, and this one's the version of the Obelisk with the Transcendent Katana unchained in it. It's only toughness 12, but it does have a massive 24 wounds and more importantly a 4 plus invulnerable, so enemy anti-tank weapons aren't going to find too much purchase. And like the rest it does move a little bit faster, with its ridiculous profile though, it is going to struggle to move around any sort of terrain. This one gets the Tesla Spheres, the same as the Obelisk, though it doesn't get the anti-fly keyword on them. But for all the extra points, as well as the invulnerable save, you also pick up some powers of the Catan. Previously you had to choose just one of them, now you get to choose two. And the choice is between a fairly potent Torrent Flamer called Cosmic Fire, loads of hits at strength 6 AP 2. A nice generalist strength 10 AP 3 damage 3 shot in Antimatter Meteor, or the fairly spooky Times Arrow. Just a single shot, but hitting on a 2 plus with anti character 4 plus and devastating wounds. So basically, if it hits, it's a 4 plus chance to deal a flat 6 wounds to the enemy character, quite likely killing them dead. Overall, it really is a lot more threatening than it used to be. I wouldn't be too surprised if it went up in points again as a result. The 375 has had it drop a bit. I still feel like the ridiculous profile that it has on the board is going to give it problems in any sort of competitive game where 10th edition terrain tends to be at least fairly tight. Definitely seems kind of fun though, would really ruin some enemy infantry formations between the Tesla Fears and Cosmic Fire, some general purpose damage with Antimatter Meteor, maybe flexed into Times Arrow if there's a particularly good target. Lastly for the technically vehicle class units we've got the Convergence of Dominion, the Necron Fortification, and these things have changed a bit, I guess we've yet to see their points which really could shift around quite a lot with their new profile, they're way easier to kill at toughness 9 and 7 wounds. Previously they were a very chunky toughness 11 and 10 wounds. And you can now take them just in units of 1 rather than having to commit to the big 3 of them. Which was never really going to happen for most people at 2000 points. They have a slightly tame shooting attack in the transdimensional abductor. Could certainly surprise an enemy terminator though. And their main thing that they bring to the game has been swapped around. Previously it was re-rolls for reanimation rolls. Now it's just a 6 plus feel no pain to infantry units within 6 inches of them. Otherwise they have normal fortification style rules plus grant cover like other bits of terrain would. 
over all these things absolutely couldn't get any worse so having the option to field it in ones and giving a somewhat usable buff seems like it could be a good start they still would have to be fairly cheap to justify themselves though next up let's go through the katan shards and in general the big change that these guys have had is that they've gained a 5 plus feel no pain just so they're enormously ridiculously tanky now they're still toughness 11 with their 4 plus invulnerable save their necrodermis still has half damage and they still reanimate wounds so to get a 5 plus feel no pain on top of all that is pretty obnoxious unless the opponent can bring a lot of force to bear on one point these things are just going to take some chip damage and heal up due to that reason i think it's pretty possible that they go up in points the katana thought were already fairly playable before the codex it seems hard to imagine that they just give them all extra 50% durability for free and not charge a bit for it. I guess they do move only 6 inches so they won't be quite as fast at bringing themselves to bear which could be a slight issue. I guess that could be part of the swing against them. But otherwise going through the Catan the Deceiver gets a Cosmic Insanity attack. 6 shots with damage 1 that's sniping an anti-character. Not reliably going to be able to kill characters but at least threaten it. And then in melee he attacks with a golden fist, 8 attacks at strength 8, AP 3 and damage 3, better than most of his peers against terminators. Otherwise he has stealth so is tougher than the rest at range and his grand illusion special rule allows you to redeploy units not after knowing first turn. But that can still be handy for putting things into strategic reserve or just making sure that your units are optimised so that when the first blows come to pass things that can effectively be safely hidden can be and just be ready to move out to hit the opponent. The Katan Shard of the Nightbringer was 255 points before and he has received a second buff as well as the Feel No Pain in that his side of the Nightbringer attack has gone up from damage d6 to a monstrous damage d6 plus 2. Maybe he was getting jealous of the Avatar of Cain which does have a similar sort of profile to him and he wanted to have that kind of threat in melee. Overall that makes him an absolutely fantastic brawler now, massively tough and massively dangerous against enemy heavies. He also has a potent sweep attack that's good at killing standard issue space marines, gaze of death for a big damage d6 plus 3 shooting attack, and at the end of the fight phase he can drain life, enemy units within 6 inches will get d3 mortal wounds sucked out of their souls. Overall the Nightbringer is looking pretty nasty, a very big and scary damage dealer. The Void Dragon didn't get any major changes other than the Feel No Pain. He is the anti-vehicle specialist Katan. When he's shooting he gets a Voltaic Storm, so a bunch of Strength 7, AP 1 and Damage 2 shots. Good against lighter or medium infantry there. And then he gets to throw his Void Spear when shooting and also fight in melee with it. Getting anti-vehicle 2 plus on those damage D6 plus 2 attacks. He does have a good chance to kill certain things like Imperial Knights in a single turn if he gets a good roll. Otherwise he gets some tail blades to hit some infantry in melee and gets to mash or absorb some mortal wounds off a vehicle and heal himself up with that. Overall he's generally been considered as one of the stronger Katarn for a while now. I'm sure that will continue to be the case. Finally perhaps the one that was usually being run was the Transcendent Katarn given that you could give that the Sempaternal Weave for the 4 plus feel no pain. But now he can't take enhancements as it's on his data sheet and gets a 5 plus feel no pain base so I guess he's on the same level as the others again. I guess he isn't an epic hero like the rest though so you could take more than one if you wanted. Besides that the transcendent katan can deep strike and he gets to teleport on and off the board if he advances so you could have him jump to the other side of the board and then shoot enemies with his seismic assault a bunch of strength 8 attacks with damage d3. Then in combat he's kind of better at killing elite infantry than tough stuff. 8 attacks at strength 9, AP 3 and damage D6 is going to be pretty ruinous against infantry but not going to be the biggest deal against tanks and vehicles wounding on 5s. Next up we get on to Necron characters. So let's talk through the overlords and nobles first then some of the special and destroyer characters and finish up with the cryptex. First up we have Zarek the Silent King himself. 420 points and certainly more of a rarity on the table in 10th edition than 9th. He's got a big and really quite complicated profile. A central throne with 16 wounds being shielded by two meneers with 5 wounds each. Or with a 2 plus save and a 4 plus invulnerable. He now moves a little bit faster than he did before at 8 inches rather than 7. Then he gets to attack with 3 different shooting profiles. A whole bunch of indirect fire from the Staff of Stars. And then some pretty enormous shooting from the Annihilator Beams of the Meneers. 
each one at strength 14 and flat damage 6. He gets a bunch of strength 8 and AP3 damage 2 in melee. And then otherwise, the biggest things that he does are his buffing rules. The Fairer of Stars seems like the go-to one now. This one's an aura of reroll hit rolls and wound rolls of 1, now both in melee and range rather than just at range as it was previously. Quite a solid damage boost that affects himself as well. This will also be a flat damage boost to his melee output as well, so he'll be more serious in combat than he was before. Otherwise, he's had a few other minor changes. Deadly Demise is still clarified to be Zarek only and not his Meneers. He swapped his Cancel Battleshock ability for a 6-inch aura of plus 1 leadership, which I guess is kind of fine, but not huge. And they've slightly buffed his Feron of Blade special rule, meaning that he gets to reroll charge rolls and also add plus 1 strength to the attacks of units that are within range of that. But unless you've got a ridiculously critical long charge to make, I can't see that basically ever being the best play versus just getting you the big damage rerolls. Overall, I'd rate the single biggest change as that change to the Fair Run of Stars for the hit rerolls and wound rerolls applying in melee, a serious buff to his own combat abilities, and any other Necrons happening to be fighting in melee nearby. For the slightly lower echelons of Necron nobility, first up we have the Overlord, 85 points prior to the Codex. He's got more flexible war gear than the Translocation Shroud one that we talked about previously, but is otherwise similar. Can have an Overlord's Blade with devastating wounds, or swap it out for either a Staff of Light or Void Scythe with Strength 12, AP 3 and Damage 3. That one is quite nice, I guess. It's quite tanky with Toughness 5, a 2 plus save and a 4 plus invulnerable, and minus 1 damage. And its main purpose is to bring some free stratagems for his Necron unit, 0 CP for a Battle Tactic stratagem once per battle round. As with the rest, the Resurrection Orb one has been changed to a single bonus D6, as opposed to the more reliable once every command phase. Overall, I think I'd hope that he might be a little bit cheaper than the Shroud one, otherwise that movement buff does seem like quite a nice advantage for the new guy. I guess being extra hard to kill with a minus one damage thing does have its perks though, and this one does have more flexibility if you like, say, the Void Scythe, or want to ditch the Res Orb for the Tachyon Arrow. He is going to be pretty detachment dependent depending on battle tactics. There's a couple of nice ones in the Awakened Dynasty still I think with the re-roll hits. And he could be nice for the Canoptic Court Devastating Wound option one. The Royal Warden has had things changed. Previously before the Codex he was 40 points. A minor commander with 4 wounds at toughness 5 and no invulnerable save. Fighting with a Relic Gauss Blaster with 2 shots and a further rapid fire 2. A strength 5 AP 1 and damage 2 so he does chip in a bit to his unit's damage output personally. Previously, his special rule were to grant the heavy and the assault keywords to the unit that he was leading, which could be useful enough to get, say, Gauss Reaper Warriors moving forward faster perhaps, but I think that the rules change has been a good one. His adaptive strategy now allows you to fall back, and he can still shoot and charge when you do that. This seems nice to have for Necron Warriors or Immortals fighting for the midfield, Generally Necrons hopefully at least tend to be quite durable with their reanimation and things, so you might have a unit that just gets a lot of its members killed, but then the enemies just wound up in combat with them, and then just being able to disengage and light them up with Gauss fire is, seems like quite a good solution. Overall I'd say that he's pretty much improved due to that. If he does remain that cheap, I feel like he could be interesting as a unit on the midfield objectives, though he is going to face stiff competition from things like Cryptex that add you a whole load of defence in. Next up we have the Catacomb Command Barge, this one was previously 150 points, and a similar sort of profile to the Annihilation Barge, toughness 8, 9 wounds, and a 4 plus invulnerable save, and now this one also gets the boosted movement to move 10. He's a bit tougher than standard Necron vehicles, as he gets a minus 1 to wound built in with the advanced quantum shielding, and otherwise he provides 2 buffs to Necrons nearby, the carrier wave to give them extra objective control, which I think is okay and I guess makes Necron Warriors in the midfield just a bit obnoxious on objectives, plus a Resurrection Orb to again allow you to target one unit once per game, either Necron Mounted or Necron Infantry for a big D6 reanimation. Otherwise you get some shooting with either a Gauss Cannon or Tesla Cannon, plus probably an Overlord's Blade in melee unless you give him the Staff of Light. He sadly doesn't get the Overlord keyword for better interaction with the Abasance Phalanx though, which does seem like a bit of a letdown. Could be kind of nice with the 4 plus feel no pain save in the Awakened Dynasty. That at least feels like it would get him to the point where he'd be annoyingly durable, and he might be a better target now that you can't give it to the Catan. 
Next up, we've got the last remaining couple of noble special characters. And first up, we have Imitech the Stormlord, busy usurping Zarek's reign. Before the Codex, he was 100 points, and in the book, it looks like he's changed very little indeed. He's basically gained one extra wound, so he's a tiny bit tougher if the rest of his bodyguard get killed. Otherwise, he does what he did before. He'll get you a command point per turn, no questions asked. So quite nice for any detachment where you think you're going heavy on the CP and they're going to be a big deal. Perhaps the Canoptic formation and the Hypercrypt Legion with its big movement CP could be quite big deals for that. And otherwise beyond that he doesn't really offer much to his squad besides raw fight. When he's shooting he gets both the Gauntlet of Fire for a Flamer type attack plus the Staff of the Destroyer to help him kill some Space Marines. He's somewhat punchy in combat with the same profile there. Devastating Wounds gets added in to the Strength 6 AP3 damage to them, and then once per game he can call a storm, hopefully while surrounded by enemy units in your command phase if you can be. Enemy units within 12 inches take D3 Mortal Wounds on a 2+, or a big D3 plus 3 on a 6. Overall I feel like 400 points is definitely enough to be tempting if that's what he stays. He is a bit of a strange character in that he wants to stay safe to keep on generating those command points, but otherwise everything else that he brings makes him want to just run at the enemy and deal as much damage as he can. Traz and the Infinite does feel like a bit of a letdown. He was previously 75 points and I was hoping that Games Workshop might throw him a bone given that his datasheet was clearly very unpopular before. Kind of sad for such an iconic character. Basically his only useful rule is to bring Necrons the Sticky Objectives ability. The one where if he holds an objective in the command phase you get to control it until the opponent can actually take it off you. That is quite helpful when you're going about the battlefield claiming points. But otherwise he doesn't really do any significant damage. The Empathic Obliterator is only AP 0 so not very good against anything without very low saves. And his surrogate host ability to basically take over another Necron sort of means that you're just taking another character that was doing its job quite well and then replacing them with a durable but underwhelming character in Trazin. Even if you're sacrificing a cheap royal warden for that, it's not really the best. Overall, I feel like it was a bit of a missed opportunity to improve his datasheet a bit here. To be used competitively, he really would have to be super cheap, and basically only be there to do sticky objectives work, plus maybe just add a little bit of damage and durability to his unit. Next up, we've got the destroyer characters. The Scorpec Lord was 100 points previously, and I feel like he's going to be a bit more interesting with the changes to Scorpec Destroyers. He's got a big tanky stat line in himself. In the Codex, he's gained an extra wound to 7 wounds and an extra pip of movements to match his destroyer charges. So overall, he is generally quite tanky at T7 with his 4 plus and vulnerable save, and fairly big threat in melee as well, with a sweep and strike type profile, plus a gun in the Enmitic Annihilator. He causes some impact mortal wounds when he charges and also gets Scorpec destroyers to get lethal hits which is really quite big on mid strength strength 7 weapons and it makes them far more dangerous against tougher stuff. Particularly as they reroll everything to hit now they could fish for lethal hits and get a lot more of those. Overall this guy plus Scorpex does look kind of terrifying on the charge now in a way that they weren't before. Even with the extra wound though they're still not going to amount to a particularly durable unit. Though I guess the 8 inch movement might give them a little bit more help getting there. The Locust Lord still remains despite his absence of a kit on sale. Again he moves 8 inches to match his Locust. And otherwise his datasheet is basically the same aside from the standard resurrection orb changes. It's a little bit less tanky at Tovner 6 and 6 wounds. He does get the 4 plus invulnerable save again. He can either take a Lord's Blade or a Staff of Light. And his primary rule is the Destroyer Cult special rule. That one allows his unit to get critical hits on a 5+, plus, so really quite good for lethal hits on the Gauss Locust Destroyers, or maybe on the sustained hits for the Locust Heavies. I feel like at least out of a few of the detachments, he seems like at least a fairly interesting option, particularly for anything that gets full reroll hits, and the Locust Destroyers themselves can generate that if they can be closest to a unit or an objective. Next up, we've got the Hexmark Destroyer, who was 80 points before the Codex, Though I feel like he is perhaps one of the units that's come off worse from the changes compared with others. He is a little bit faster, moving 8 inches round the board like a lot of the mid-movement stuff, and strikes with a bunch of enmitic disintegrator pistols. 6 shots hitting at 2s at strength 6 and AP-2 damage 1. They've traded the precision keyword for ignored cover. 
So I guess no sniping characters, but we'll be quite a bit better at flushing some space marines from cover or something. Unfortunately for him, Games Workshop did decide that enough was enough with the endless pistol return fire mechanic. That rule has been turned from an absolute godly rule where you could just repeatedly take shot after shot with the pistols each time a unit nearby you was hit and turn it into something kind of underwhelming where now if the unit within three inches of him gets shot he can only return fire at that unit and he can only do so once per turn not endlessly over and over again. Definitely a big nerf there, certainly might well come with a points cut and he could still be an interesting unit for deep striking as a lone operative Handling lighter enemy infantry could be fun in a hypercrypt with the repeated deep strikes as well. Definitely a bit sad that he's not quite as much of a multi-fire pistol monster as he was before. I perhaps can kind of see why Games Workshop went this way with him though. Hopefully it comes hand in hand with a generous points cut. Finally we have all the different flavours of Cryptech and we'll start off with the Technomancer. He's maybe the one that's seen some of the biggest changes. He now has to take the Canoptic Cloak and has lost the old Finecast Kit Canoptic Control node as an option. That perhaps is a bit sad, as previously he could be used to give Canoptic units nearby a plus one to hit. The Canoptic Cloak was maybe the more popular loadout though, giving him extra movement. He does move 10 with Fly just at base now. And if he's in a unit, he gives them a 5 plus feel no pain and can also repair one model nearby for an extra D3 lost wounds. It's been a bit of a blow to him not being able to join the Lich Guard though, as the rest of the Cryptex can't now, as he was maybe the best one with them, as he was good for buffing multi-wound units. But fortunately Games Workshop have given him a different unit to lead, and now it looks like he's going to be best friends with the Wraiths. A big 4 wounds, a 4 plus invulnerable, and a 5 plus feel no pain should keep them tanky. Still looks like he should be quite good, will be interested in leading Wraiths in the Awakened Dynasty for the plus 1 to hit that he can give them, and again as ever in the Canoptec court. It is worth noting as well that his cloak loadout lost the load operative ability which he had with that, though I think in general it wasn't that many people who actually used him as a lone operative given that the 5 plus feel no pain is quite so valuable. Next we've got the Psychomancer which did get some improvements though he was pretty bad before. Previously he was 50 points, now he is a fairly fragile Cryptek with some single strength 6 and damage 3 attacks and two Battleshock style debuffs. The first one is his Nightmare Shroud. In the enemy's command phase, if they're within 6 inches, they need to take Battleshock even if they've taken any casualties and the unit is below full strength in any way and they do so at a minus 1 to the test. Quite nice on midfield objectives there and occasionally that will swing some points. And the other one is his Harbinger of Despair special rule, an 18 inch threat against one enemy unit to test Battleshock at minus 1 leadership. And that one can happen at the start of any phase in your turn as opposed to just the shooting phase as it was before. That bit is less helpful while Games Workshop has the core Battleshock rules as not really doing much in your own turn. It could just prevent stratagems or maybe be relevant for the odd secondary. Still just generally feels a bit hard to justify though. If you're taking a Cryptek to lead a unit then in general one of the durability granting ones I think is almost certainly going to be more tempting even if what he gives does have some value now. The Chronomancer I think has got fairly fun rules in 10th edition. He's not really changed too much besides not being able to lead Lich Guard and I guess the debate would usually be between this guy and Oricon to be able to lead Necron Warriors or Immortals. Presuming you want a Cryptek durability character for them of course. He attacks with his Eon Stave with a few Strength 5 and AP 1 attacks both at range and in melee. And his two special rules are a minus one to hit both at range and in melee, and the Chronometron which allows you to move shoot move, potentially getting your warriors or immortals up the board really quite quickly to get to midfield objectives, or ghosting in and out of cover to maybe shoot while not being shot, or get as many models with a cover save as you can. Overall he does seem generally quite cheap and quite fun, making the squad a bit more durable while also adding loads of movement. It might not make for the toughest Necron squad in the world, but I feel like it could be quite fun when combined with the new Royal Warden. He could have them just leave combat and walk away, and then move, shoot, move after that. The Plasmancer got a little bit better as well. He was previously 55 points, and he has a bit more serious shooting and melee threat. His ranged attacks give you 3 attacks with his Plasmic Lance, a strength 7, AP 3, and damage 2. His main boost is to give his unit critical hits on a 5+, so that would be sustained hits too for Tesla things or lethal hits for Gauss. He's particularly relevant whenever you can get 4 rerolls to hit. 
say for example the Overlord Enhancement in the Obeisance Phalanx, or the new version of the Conquering Tyrant worn in the Awakened Dynasty. Otherwise, as a boost to his abilities, his Living Lightning rule has got better, that's basically an extra shooting attack at 18 inches. It used to be a rule where you'd roll one dice for every enemy model in the unit, and for each six they took a mortal wound. Now it's just roll 46, and for each four plus they take a mortal wound, so usually two on average. That just feels a bit stronger really, means they actually does some reliable mortal wound output to tough stuff like vehicles, which is generally more powerful than doing mortal wounds to hordes. Overall, if you just want a more dangerous and threatening looking squad, he does genuinely look a bit better than he was. Could be fun with Tesla Immortals, maybe. Lastly, for the Cryptets, we've got Orican the Diviner and Illuminor Seraz. Orican, who just got his fancy new model, was 80 points before, and otherwise his datasheet really hasn't changed. But I thought in general it was quite a good datasheet to start with, giving the unit a 4 plus invulnerable save. That one very nice on Necron Warriors. As well as that, he's got his The Stars Are Right special rule, a once per game surprising melee buff really. He's usually kind of tame in melee, but then once per game he jumps up to a big 6 attacks at strength 12 with AP3 and each successful wound being a D3 devastating wound attack, which is pretty brutal. Against bigger targets, that will often be just around about against slots of fairly big targets, that's a good chance of being something like 6 wounds overall. Overall still seems tempting. Maybe one that's a bit more tempting on warriors rather than immortals, perhaps, and he can't lead Lich Guard anymore. Finally, for the Core Necrons Codex, we have Illuminor Seras. He was 185 points before, and a lone operative if he's near other Necron units, generally aiming to buff multiple units with his mechanical augmentation. He's perhaps surprisingly tough and mighty for any one Cryptek. His wounds 9 and toughness 8 with a 2 plus save, a 4 plus invulnerable and a 4 plus feel no pain, so he's not going to get gunned down particularly easily. And he does have some combat threat of his own with the Eldritch Lance with some damage 3 shooting and a similar sort of profile in melee. His biggest boosts are improving Necron battle line type units. Whenever they make an attack, they get an extra pip of AP against their target. Very nice on things like Tesla or Gauss Immortals and good on Warriors. And when the enemy attacks them, then they worsen their AP by 1. Again, probably better on Immortals more so than Warriors, though it's both helpful. He has had a slight nerf to the mechanical augmentation in that it only goes to 3 inches rather than 6, so it's not quite as flexible in terms of positioning. It just means that the squads will have to have at least part of their units a little bit closer to him than before, but he could still be buffing a lot of stuff with that. Overall, maybe with Immortals looking a little bit more interesting, and a few detachments that might be able to help them out a bit, perhaps he could see a bit more of a resurgence. Finally, I thought I'd just quickly mention the Necron Forge World units that we have. A few of the Canoptech creations in particular are interesting in the Canoptech Court formation. The Tombstalker might be the slightly weaker of the two, I'd say. He was previously 130 points with 9 wounds, a 4 plus invulnerable save, and a bunch of attacks that generally are good at beating up medium infantry, but not too much more than that. Plus his special rule is a bit underwhelming with free heroic intervention. I'd say for the Canoptic Court, the Tomb Sentinel could be a bit more interesting there. He's got a similar sort of profile, but his attacks come at strength 10, AP 2 and damage 2. Given 4 hit rerolls all the time, that could be interesting. He also comes with a Gloom Prism with the old wording, so a 4 plus save against the psychic attacks, and he gets extra AP for being on objectives and also targeting enemy objective holders. 415 points, I think he's usable, given the big advantages of the damage buffs that you can get from that. He does have Deep Strike as well, could make him at least of passing interest to the Hypercrypt Legion. Next up, the Canoptic Acanthrites are 85 points for three of them. These are interesting fast movers with 12 inch move beasts with the infiltrators keyword. So they could start in the midfield and then attack the enemy with basically some melter beam type shots, the same profile as a standard melter gun, and they've got similar sort of durability to flayed ones I'd say. Only 3 models, but toughness 5, 2 wounds and a 3 plus save. Another option for forward deployment type units that might be competing alongside other things like flayed ones and tomb blades. I have seen these guys used from time to time, but I would say that they're quite niche. Otherwise, there's the Tesseract Arc for an 130 point toughness 9, 10 wound Necron vehicle with a 4 plus invulnerable save. Again, sort of general purpose enough, I'd say fairly balanced with the Annihilation Barge, 
The test about Singularity Cannon can at least threaten both tough stuff and lighter stuff, and then you pair it with either Gauss Cannons, Particle Beamers, or Tesla Cannons for overall something that should at least make itself a nuisance to medium infantry. Its gravitational field can slow down enemies trying to charge you. I'm not really sure that it's got particularly more interesting with any of the formations though, most of them don't really bring you enormous amounts of changes just for standard vehicles. I guess it could be warping off the board with hypercrypts to get lines of sight perhaps. Finally we have the Seraptic Heavy Construct. Before the update this was 540 points. A great big Titanic Walker vehicle that feels like it was a bit over costed really at this kind of points cost. It does get scary damage output though with the option for transdimensional projectors with a huge D6 plus 4 damage or slightly more balanced general purpose singularity generators with a lot of shots that damage 4. Despite basically being an enormous Canoptech construct, it doesn't actually have the Canoptech keyword, otherwise it probably would just flip from being kind of underwhelming to far too much in the Canoptech court. I guess the Hypercrypt Legion does have a few things that can target Titanic units specifically, like the one that makes enemy weapons hazardous. In general, I'd probably rate it as a bit pricey for what it does though. So with Forge World units talked about, that just about brings us to the end of this look at Codex Necrons. Really quite a lot of undead goodness, and hopefully a few more interesting ways to play the army. I feel that reaction to this one has been a bit mixed. There's definitely a bunch of disappointing stuff in here, though I do think there's some fun stuff too. Hopefully after we get a bit more chance to test things and Games Workshop have released the points, we can see what's looking good or not, and whether or not the Necrons are going to hold up well. Certainly my initial reaction would be that it doesn't look like they're going to be looking like one of the strongest factions in Warhammer 40k. Despite some fun stuff, they really have taken some big hits to some of the strongest things in their codex, like the Lich Guard blocks, which don't look very viable now. Detachments-wise, I suspect that the Hypercrypt one, the Canoptic Court, and the Awakened Dynasty seem to be the best of the five right now. The Abasance one just feels a little bit on the niche side without enough to really support it, and the Annihilation Legion for the Destroyers, bar having one or two useful things, just doesn't really look like it's enough to support an entire army. The unit losses are a bit of a shame, really quite sad to lose some flavourful characters and I think it is a bit disappointing that the standard Lord has gone away, he just feels like a bit of a basic really. And then for the other datasheet changes it does look like a lot more of a mixed bag, some things have definitely improved quite a bit, Race are looking nice at 4 wounds with 5 plus feel no pains running around, Scorpet destroyers with some nice re-rolls genuinely look threatening. The Silent King is probably worth another look now he fights so much harder in combat with access to his own buffs, and unless they put up the price of the Catan by a rather crazy amount, a 5 plus feel no pain looks like it's good news for them. For negatives though, the standard playstyle that's been the case for most of the start of 10th edition just looks like it's not going to be anywhere near as credible, big stacking reanimation synergies probably aren't getting to the same sort of breakpoint where you make big tanky blocks and just move them up the board. Kind of a shame really, as even if they did feel a little bit over-encouraged by the current index, it still does feel rather Necron with some massive amounts of durability and things just not staying dead. Otherwise, for slightly more disappointing things, the Warriors will be a bit sad to not be reanimating as well and get worse Gauss Reapers. Hopefully their points go down as a result. And the Hexmark Destroyer, I think, was maybe a little bit sad to lose his silly pistol attacks. It was a bit fun the way he just kept on firing. Overall, let me know what you think, though. Hopefully Necrons shake out with some good, strong, credible playstyles. Reaction to the book does seem to be kind of mixed at best. There are some fun things, but it's very much had the shine taken off by others. I guess we'll know the full picture when the points are out. In any case, I'll be hoping to make a few more Necron videos over the next few days or so. Feel free to subscribe to Auspex Tactics if you'd like to see more like this. I do tend to post 40k videos of one sort or another pretty much every day. Finally, if you've been enjoying all the videos on the channel and you'd like to keep big projects like this coming, I would just like to mention that Auspex Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description if you'd like to help support. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, an absolutely massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.